Um, the first item on the agenda tonight is public comment. I don't know if there's anybody here for public comment. If you would please come on up to the table. Absolutely. And are you Lindsay? Lindsay Page. So if you would um, give your name and address for the record, just so that we have it. Sure. Uh, to speak if you would do that, that would probably help the sure. list, the broad TV audience, as we say in the Zoom audience. So Lindsay Page, together with Caleb Molino at 47 Mayo App. Okay. Welcome. And Joshua Conlon. Um, I am 22 Oakers. All right. So we have up to three minutes, okay. but we're happy to hear your story. Thank you. So Caleb's going to start. All right. Birthday. So maybe you'll <laughs> okay. give him one extra minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. My name is Caleb and I love to bike. The reason I think our town should have a skate park is because it would be a great way for kids and adults to have something to do and ride a bike or skateboard or like anything that with wheels. And, <laughs> and it would be a good way for them to meet each other. Okay. Um, so in an effort to um, keep my comments to three minutes, I, I wrote something out that I'm going to go ahead and read. Um, so my name is Lindsay Page. I'm a resident at 47 Mayo Ave. I'm a faculty member at Brown University, and I'm mom to Caleb and his sister, Nora, who just finished eighth grade at Pollard. Do you want to do any more introductions? Josh? Yeah, I'm Josh Conlon. Um, I have a daughter, Sydney, at Pollard in eighth grade as well, and a son who's also 10 at um, Newman. Um, member of the Needham Exchange Club and um, super happy to try to get this done. Yeah. Uh, so we're here today to advocate for the design and construction of an action park for skateboarding, scootering, and biking here in Needham. We're not the first to advocate for such a space. As Marianne Cooley noted in town meeting, hardly a week goes by that a resident isn't asking for an action park. To the best of our understanding, formal efforts reach back at least 15 years with design and feasibility planning included in Park and Rec's 2008 five-year plan. We previously submitted a letter detailing the benefits of an action park and some key considerations for planning. Today, we want to highlight two key motivations for prioritizing this for next year's town meeting. First, although action parks are suitable for all ages, their core constituents are tweens and teens. For Needham's young people especially, an action park would foster positive mental health. Last year, U.S. health experts declared a national emergency in adolescent and child mental health. Needham youth have not been immune from these trends. Because of the pandemic, opportunities for youth to gather in authentic, constructive, but less formal ways remain reduced. For example, this past year, Pollard Middle School had no school dances. An action park would provide our town's youth with a site for gathering and engaging in age-appropriate, constructive activities. Town leaders, including within the Park and Rec Commission, have noted that teens and tweens are a group that as a community, we need to find better ways to engage. An action park would be a terrific, terrific strategy, both by making it a free, accessible, open space and by providing programming through lessons, clubs, or other events. Second, an action park would provide an outlet, particularly for youth who do not participate in team sports. Team sports are rightly a point of pride and focus for Needham, However, they are not for everyone. Many parents have told us some version of the following. Their child tried team sports, but it just didn't take. And all that child wants to do is ride their bike, scooter, or skateboard. Needham should serve such children with as much passion as goes into our, as goes into our existing sports teams, providing these young people with high quality space to enjoy their craft. Sports like skateboarding and BMX biking are mainstream with inclusion now in the Olympics. Needham youth with these interests must travel to facilities in other towns, requiring their caregivers to drive, and most importantly, hindering their ability to find community with like-minded youth in town. It seems to us that there's strong support for an action park, tempered by the recognition that space, space will be an issue. We believe that the space challenge is not insurmountable, but it does require focused attention and political prioritization to solve. So today, we ask the select board's support and partnership, uh, together with concrete guidance and advice regarding how to move this forward, 
as quickly as possible to support our town youth who would benefit from a Needham Action Park in the near term. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming in and talking. And I, I know that both of you are aware that this is um, a question that's largely driven right, by the Park and Recreation Committee and that this is something that they are actively interested in and pursuing and discussing as well. And that it has a space on the town's five year townwide plan. The location is, as you alluded to, a big question and a big part of the challenge um, and one of the pieces that we'll need to collectively work to figure out. But I think that this board has heard that <coughs> and um, we'll be listening and trying to figure out how this can, can happen. There's a large part of the community, as you say, who, who don't necessarily do team sports mm -hmm. and um, there are other things to be done. Yeah. I, I think the biggest part in. of what we're saying at this point is, that this is something that we feel and many other people in the town um, feel should be at least explored sooner rather than later. Um, and as you said, it is on the five-year plan. This has been on the five-year plan since 2007. Um, by the time it's- I don't think that's true, but, but you may be correct that it's been on and off apparently. It has definitely been on the 2007 plan to be explored at that point. Um, so by the time a park may exist, hopefully, um, per as it's going now, this will be 20 years from the first time it's hit Needham's plan. So this keeps coming up. This is something the residents of town continue to ask for, to ask for, to ask for. And we feel that you are in, we all are in a pretty interesting time where you have very interested parents, you have access to people who've done this before living in town and you have a large contingency of the residents to make something like this happen, so. Okay, thank you for coming in. Thank you, thank you very birthday. much. Thank you. All right, the next item on our agenda is a proclamation. Um, for anybody who was uh, watching TV recently or reading news, um, there was a big event that happened in the UK and our sister community, Needham Market, um, has uh, asked if we might celebrate with them. And so I will turn to our proclamation reader, <laughs> which is one of the official titles of the vice chair of the board. All right, thank you so much, Madam Chair. So the proclamation states, whereas the town of Needham, Massachusetts was incorporated in 1711 and then named by the Royal Governor Joseph Dudley, who took the name from Needham Market in England and Whereas Needham Market, Suffolk, England was established in 1290, oh, 1245, 466 years earlier than Needham in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And whereas in 1993, Needham Town Meeting resolved that a close bond of social and cultural friendship be developed between two communities. And whereas that bond has developed through numerous visits by officials from each community to the other, and whereas the town of Needham recognizes the significance of the Platinum Jubilee celebrating the 70th anniversary of the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, and whereas Needham joins with the residents of Needham Market to mark this joyous occasion. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Needham Select Board and the people of Needham, Massachusetts, and the United States of America extend their warmest regards to the town council and the people of Needham Market, Suffolk, England, on the joyous occasion of the Platinum Jubilee. It's a motion, second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Then we'll give them the wave. <laughs> Congratulations. All right. Madam Chair, I'd like to move the consent. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? People will notice that on the consent agenda, we do have um, the proposed penalties uh, for al alcohol compliance check failures. Um, so I just uh, flagged that as something that's an ongoing area that we're monitoring. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Unanimous, thank you. All right, we have a public hearing for the Verizon Cable Television Contact Renewal. Is everybody remote, Miles? No, I've got to distract some people over to speak. Okay. 
So I may uh, start by reading the preamble here. Good evening and welcome to the Town of Needham's public hearing on Verizon's cable license renewal. I'm Marianne Cooley, chair of the Select Board, which is the cable license issuing authority under Mass General Laws Chapter 166A. With me tonight are other members of the Select Board, Town Manager Kate Fitzpatrick, Town Cable Council Bill August, and support services manager Miles Tucker, who worked closely with Verizon and Attorney August on the negotiation of a Needham Verizon renewal license. Notice of this hearing was published for two successive weeks in local newspapers, and copies of the legal advertisements are here entered into the select board packet. By way of background for the public, state law requires the holding of a public hearing prior to final action on a proposed renewal license, which shall include opportunity for public comment on town needs, Verizon's performance, and the proposed renewal license. Based on the information before us this evening and based on prior public hearing, the select board may take final action on and approve or deny the renewal proposal before us this evening. Public comments, if any, as well as questions to Verizon should be directed through me, and I will rule if they are in order. Before hearing from the public, we will first recognize Verizon's representative at tonight's hearing, John Harrington, followed by Miles Tucker from the Office of Town Manager. We will then accept comments from the public, if any, followed by select board discussion of the proposed renewal and a possible motion regarding final action of the proposed renewal. Thank you. Attorney Harrington, you are now welcome to make introductory remarks. Attorney <laughs> Harrington uh, was uh, just Attorney emailing me that here. he was here. having access to- You understand that there is a slight issue with the link that is on the agenda. And there are there is a webinar ID that has worked. Um, however, um, the actual link itself has not, so it's just a mix up on there. We've been able to get some folks on such as attorney August who's here joining us as well. Um, but it does not appear that we have attorney Harrington representing Verizon at this time. He, he was just trying have to we dial- him um, on some other means? Not, not yet at this point in time though. Um, attorney August, if you are here, um, and it appears if he's the 781 number um, over there and um, attorney August, if you could uh, confirm which phone number there, we could bring attorney Harrington in. Yeah, I was just reading an email from attorney oh, Harrington. You are muted. Okay. Can you hear me now? Do you have to enable my uh, sound? We we can. We we're getting it now. Yeah. All right. So John Harrington, Verizon. Hi everyone. Good evening. Bill Good. August here, uh, Cable Council to the town, and uh, thank you all. Uh, Miles has done an amazing job on, on this renewal, and we have some good things to report. I do want to note, John Harrington, is, uh, Verizon's counsel, has sent me a few emails in the last couple of minutes. He was encountering uh, difficulty. He pressed the link but could, and tried to enter the webinar ID but could not get through. He said he would try by phone, and then he tried by phone but he's muted on the phone. I don't know if he's still on phone. Can you try <laughs> unmuting him on phone? It, it's He's either a 781 number or a 617 number without giving away his full cell phone number. Um, if you could let me know if he's a 781 or a 617, we can let him in. I believe, <laughs> uh, by memory, he says seven. Let me just check what I have because he has a few different numbers. Of course. Um, I'm just going into my directory. He says, I'm on phone and can hear you. Let me ask him what number. He has 781. Or okay. All right. So this is good news. He's on phone and he can hear us. John, are you on a 781 or a 617 number? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 617. I'm sending him an email. Uh, about two years and two months in, and 
Still not quite down. <laughs> the irony that it's a Verizon hearing too. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Apologize for the delay, everybody. It'll just take a second, another minute, I'm sure. Madam Chair, I've allowed both to speak. So if he can hear us and wants to unmute and speak, we can identify them. I believe Star. John Harrington, if you would like to unmute and speak. 781. Great. He still needs to unmute to speak. Yeah, and you'll need to unmute it, star nine. Star that. nine to unmute. Oh, somebody's raising a hand. Yeah, Who's right. that? Okay, how was that? Terrific, Great. hooray. So I, I read a statement and you are welcome to make introductory remarks, Attorney Harrington. This is Marianne Cooley, who's the select board chair speaking. Okay, thank you. And I apologize for the uh, technical difficulties I've had joining. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Miles and uh, Bill for their cooperation and, and getting this renewal done. I think most people are aware that um, the cable industry is going through a lot of challenges right now, and um, we're all trying to be creative to um, meet each other's needs. Uh, I know it affects the PEG programs in different communities, and it's certainly um, uh, representative, uh, represented in um, subscriber uh, uh, decrease, de decreasing numbers. So um, I'll just run through a, a couple of quick things. This is similar to uh, the, the previous five-year agreement, except there is a um, uh, right to terminate, um, but it, it's conditioned upon uh, making the full payment of the PEG support payments, which over the five years will be $95,000. They will be... Um, uh, $31,667 within 45 days, 31667 on the first anniversary and a similar payment on the second anniversary. Um, PEG support remains at 5%. And um, those are the highlights that I have. I'm happy to hand it over to Bill at this point. Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, just to buy, uh, just to put uh, one of John's uh, comments in uh, context, the the dollar amounts reference refer just to one of the revenue streams in the license, the uh, equipment capital funding. Uh, there's a, an entirely separate and much larger revenue stream, which John referred to, the five percent of gross revenues annually, which is not the equipment funding, but covers the annual operational budget of the studio, the channels and the staff. Um, so there are you know, those two separate streams. And even though there is an early uh, termination option, if the capital funding is prepaid, that cannot be invoked until after three of uh, the five years and that is something Verizon has not deviated from in any town, anywhere. So it's, it's not, you know, we oppose that and saw it a longer term and no early termination, but it's just something at the corporate level uh, that they are uh, rigid on and not changing. So it's, we're just being treated the same as the other towns on that. And it has never been exercised by Verizon, even though it's been in their licenses for the last four or five years or longer, the early termination option. Uh, it has never been exercised. Thank you for that, Attorney August. Yes, and uh, Madam Chair, I just wanna, first of all, thank the team at Verizon. Um, they've been wonderful partners throughout this process. Thank Attorney Cohen, who has um, just done a lion's share of the technical aspects behind this, truly a fantastic partner through the process. and the number of town departments who've helped review this. And I'd say um, just a huge thanks to Mark Mandel and the entire team at the Needham Channel and the Needham Community uh, Television Development Corporation who've been absolutely instrumental to help us understand the technical aspects of this, to help us understand that this is a fantastic license relative to what's out there. It is shorter um, than the 10 years that I know this board prefers. But again, as Attorney August mentioned, that is Verizon corporate policy. But 
despite the shorter term, it is made up for in a relatively larger capital per subscriber payment um, that the town will be receiving, which is fantastic for the Needham Channel. And um, the up to the legal amount, um, the 5% for the operating. So this really is a fantastic license and Verizon has provided the Needham Channel um, as of right now, a uniquely capable HD option that allows it to broadcast. It's uh, a unique HD channel that highlights all the capabilities and, the, and sort of a best of programming from them. And right now Verizon's the only folks that uh, do offer that unique standalone channel, which will continue under this current license. So um, it, this definitely was a team effort um, to provide the town with uh, what we believe is, is a great license. Right. One footnote to that, if I may be 5% annual for the uh, Needham Studio and Channels operating payments. That's the maximum allowed under the Federal Cable Act. So we are receiving the maximum. Um, and that is really a, a much larger payment than the capital funding dollars that were mentioned. I also want to just echo uh, thanking, uh, John, uh, I, I mentioned how thankful we should be to Miles for doing such a meticulous job. But John Harrington really uh, came to the table uh, trying to meet us halfway and being a good negotiation partner, very responsive. So, uh, you know, thank you to uh, Verizon for sending some, you know, top people. Okay. Well, we know that uh, having these channels available or these two cable options available to our residents is important and is valued. Um, this is a public hearing. So I will just double check. I don't believe we've received any emails from the public as it relates to this license. Uh, no, Madam Chair, the town manager's office has not, and we've not been notified, in the, or rather, the town clerk has not notified us of any comments made to their office as well. Okay, thank you. So, um, because this is a public hearing, I want to ask if there's anybody from the public here who wishes to speak about the license. And if not, then I would open it up to my colleagues. Any questions or comments? Sure, Ms. Madam. Pirelli? Thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, these Besides what we've already discussed and, you know, the fees and the, the term of this license, is there anything else really of substance that this board should be aware of that has changed from prior agreements? Through the chair, no. Okay. Uh, we've updated the list of buildings based on new construction and um, not, no longer use town facilities, um, which was run through um, town departments. Great. And I want to thank you, Miles, and thank the whole team for getting this done. I know it's a lot of work. It's that uh, people can see through the packet the voluminous materials and references and it's technical in nature. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions, comments? Um, real quick, Ridge Hill Reservation still on? On the list, number 11. Here's well, once that is no longer. It's still there. Okay. It is, yes. All right. Okay, fine. Okay, anything else? And I would welcome a motion. Madam Chair, I move that the board find that the cable franchise renewal proposal of Verizon New England Inc. reasonably meets the franchise and cable related renewal needs and interests of the public and town. And that Verizon New England Inc.'s financial and technical qualification and local programming channels, facilities and services are reasonable to meet town cable franchise needs find the select board and issuing authority for the town both to accept the renewal agreement with Verizon New England Inc. effective August 15th, 2022. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? It is unanimous. Thank you, Miles. Thank Thanks you, Bill. You, Thank you, John. Thank you, Thank you very we, much. We look forward to continuing to work with Verizon. Thanks Thank so you much. all. Bye -bye. Good night. Okay. Um, the next item on our agenda this evening is a dangerous dog hearing. The dog hearing has been continued uh, from the past several hearings. Um, what I would like, well, I guess we need to bring over. Who do we have joining us tonight, Miles? We have uh, Diana Schultz, the dog's owner. Um, and I would ask that if Attorney Cohen, you're at that 617, please raise your hand via the feature there. Uh, we do have the, the dog owner here. Okay. All right, Diana, good evening. Thank you for joining us this evening. 
Hi, good evening. Um, I think I've lost track. This is our third evening. Chief Slitler, could I ask you to come up and join us? Um, we have had two updates over the last three weeks for our weekly updates. Um, the most recent one came on Monday, yesterday, I think, maybe last Friday. Um, but I just wanted to ask if you would just give us a brief update of what has uh, occurred over the most recent period. Sure, let me just pull it out a second. So I'm gonna ask the chief if he can, can tell us where we are right now. So we did receive um, uh, an update from Ms. Rasul last week um, and out of the orders that were imposed by the board, um, she provided an update of, of the uh, orders. Um, the first one um, being confined to the premises of its owner, um, West Street. So she was not in compliance based on the incident that happened um, last week, which you are aware of uh, with the docking, uh, the, the barking dog complaint. Uh, the uh, animal control officer did respond. Um, Axel was outside on the back deck. Um, was tethered, um, as you can see from the photo, the tether, it's hard to tell what the, the strength of that tether is, but it looks like it's duct taped to the deck um, and appeared to have been out for a period of time. Um, and then obviously there was no supervision for that period of time. The, the complainant that did call indicated that it had been for a lengthy period of time for hours. Um, I'm, I'm not sure it was plural in hours, but um, at least for an hour um, that we're aware of. Um, and then the, um, the others that I know that there was an issue with the um, homeowners insurance that I think that the board was looking at the information that was there. I'm not sure if that is in compliance because I'm not uh, familiar with the insurance part of it. Um, Ms. Fitzpatrick, do you know if it's compliant? Because I, I did read it and it wasn't clear to me that it was compliant either. The, home insurance. the homeowner's insurance that it actually matched what we had requested. We'll have to go through it with council. All right. So if we could ask council to please let us <coughs> and advise us. Um, and, and part of the order too was that the, if Axel was outside, that it be supervised or in a pen. And at the, at the time when the uh, animal control officer did respond, it was on the deck unsupervised. Um, and it appeared that according to the animal control officers that uh, the dog was in distress because it was warm. Um, and as the pictures do show, that does not appear that there were water in the dishes. Um, and, and obviously that's out of compliance because it was not supervised. And if you look at the deck, um, if that dog was able to break that tether the way it's secured, there is a possibility that with the height of the fencing around the deck that it could have jumped the fence. So that's something that we wanna make sure that we're in compliance with and we're able to, to deal with because obviously the result of that dog getting out could be another issue that we do not want to happen again. Okay. You may ask. Just cause I can't really see from the picture. Yeah. Sorry. Is the, is the deck? Within the fenced yard. So it goes out. It goes out. I haven't seen the whole backyard. From my understanding, that it goes out from the house, and that the deck it goes down into the yard, which is fenced in. Okay. So, but the deck. If you look at the level, of the deck, the height it's hard of the. To tell. So you could jump over. You could. Saying. Okay. And that's outside of the. That's outside. Got it. As, okay. as I and I might be wrong on that, but that might be something they could clarify. But from what I've seen, that's how I interpret it. Okay, thank you. Ms. Rosola, is that interpretation correct that the deck is uh, separate from the fenced yard but goes down to the fenced yard? No, it's not correct. The deck is within the fenced yard and the deck is higher than the fenced yard with another six, seven feet. So if Axel wants to jump, he would have to jump over 12, 13 feet, which is, I think it's impossible, they, they won't. Well, I don't think it's impossible, but but thank you for that um, feedback. But it's, it is within the fenced yard. Okay. 
Um, it would st you do understand that tethering axle on the deck does is not compliant with the order unless you or some other supervising adult is on the deck at the same time so i have sent a very long response to uh, chief uh, would you mind read it and you know what? I don't think we're going to read the response. Okay. I'll, um, I'll just summarize. But, but if you could ask, answer my question, which is, um, do you understand that, that having Axel on the deck? I understand. And my dad was inside the house cleaning what Axel has made a mess inside. So he couldn't because it was right in front of the door and my dad did not want him to come in and out. So he kept him for a while until he cleans out and Maya was inside. So Axel wanted to come inside because he cannot be separated with, from Maya. And so he started whining and my neighbors, they called the police because he was starting whining. And at that time, Axel had another accident because the night before we bought Axel um, toy and that's supposed to be a dog proof and he broke it and he swallowed the, um, the stuffing inside and that's happened before and that's an accident that happens to everybody so we expected to, him to have a bowel movement problem and that's what happened and at that time when my dad was cleaning up and he was like right few feet from him so he was supervised that's where the officer came in so in regards to the water, I explained very clearly in my email. You know what, Ms. Rizzo, we, we did understand and we did read your email. So, okay. so why we bring the difference of opinion yeah. right now? All right. And I don't have any more facts than that. I, I understand your perspective and I understand what the dog officer saw. Okay. Your perspective is that he had drunk all the water. The dog officer believes he needed more water. That's fine. We understand that right now. Okay. Um, so we have a couple of conditions that we have still asked about. Um, let me go back to some of them. Um, Mr. Borelli at the last meeting had asked about the front yard and about fencing the front yard. And my understanding is that you've made some changes to the front gate in the front porch. Um, I'm gonna ask the chief if the animal control officer can please get us some pictures of that so we can understand what's been done. It did not match uh, the question that we asked about fencing the front yard, okay? You have let us know now that you have an appointment scheduled with Dr. Fish, the veterinarian, uh, related to neutering Axel. Um, yeah. We expect to hear the report of that consult. So mm -hmm. that is taking place on June, Monday, June 19th. Yes. And then one of the other orders asks that a behavioral analysis be conducted on Axel by a certified animal behaviorist. Mm -hmm. That is scheduled for June 23rd. Yes. All right. For the most part, what I would like to do this evening, it will be to continue our hearing, but I am going to note that we do have uh, two of your neighbors who are here tonight. I don't know if they wish to provide us with any additional information <coughs> since they have come. So I am going to offer the opportunity for them to do that if they would like to. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't mind. I just, I don't want to say much because I've already spoke to all about my dog will have, but Feel free to come forward then. <laughs> And I did write something down because I'm, even though I'm not speaking much, I, I'll probably forget. Um, and we always say start with your oh, name sorry. and your address. My name is Lisa Madkins. I live at 15 Bobsled Drive, um, which is near to Hillside School. Um, uh, I just want to say to begin with, I've joined all the dog hearings via Zoom because it's really close to my heart. Um, and I don't want to say too much. But first of all, I want to thank you all for everything that you're doing. Um, all well, the time and effort. I mean, really, I really do appreciate it. Um, and making sure that Diana is sticking to all of the rules that you guys have set out for. I really do appreciate that. Um, I was part of dogs, my dog Max's attack in December, which was the fourth attack um, that both the Mal Malamutes were involved. Um, they were off leash at Hillside. Um, I did give a more detailed account, as I said, um, in January. Um, I was literally on the floor trying to pick Max up when they were attacking at both ends and it was absolutely terrifying so it was awful um anyway i'm here tonight and i just really want to let you know that max and myself are still really traumatized about this um and i'm in contact with two of other owners that were also attacked and know that them and their dogs 
I also still were having a really hard time walking in various streets, so obviously particularly particularly on West Street. I know Maureen has problems walking down the hillside. I've never even gone down the hillside yet. I just can't go there. Um, so to us, it's really important that their dogs are contained. They never escape from the house again um, and never off leash again. Um, so other families don't have to go through what we've gone through, which is just horrendous. Uh, Max doesn't like to walk around the streets anymore. Um, I usually have to drive him to Needham Centre. Uh, because then there's no dogs off leash. You know, when I'm in a busy town and the busy streets, I imagine that dog owners that live near there would be a bit more vigilant about not letting the dogs escape. Um, and it's way less stress for me and for him, actually, when he walks better. Um, so, so that's that. But it's just a bit of a pain having to drive into Needham all the time if I want to take my dog for a walk. So anyway, so that's all I wanted to say, that it's, it still really affects me and my dog and lots of other people so <coughs> thank you okay we appreciate so, that madam chair you, just um if i just may ask one of the conditions of the order is that um the vet bills have been reimbursed and i see that it says completed so i'm assuming that have your vet bills been reimbursed from as it happened i didn't ask diana for that money i actually went through my insurance because i have insurance okay. um i it was in december so okay. i did it then and i this this kind of wasn't around then. Mm -hmm. um, Max's uh, hearing was in January. Okay. So I did that. So thank you for asking. Thank but um, yeah, I did get some money. Okay. <laughs> All right, great. So I just would like to see Madam Chair proof from the other, you know, I know she's stating that people have been reimbursed by the reimbursed or insurance is paid for them. Um, as a follow -up. <laughs> um Miles, I don't know if you have proof or if you can be in touch with the other owner just to confirm that. That is a question we've asked a couple of times, but um, to, to understand the reimbursement and we understand that reimbursement has been taken care of, but we've heard some different numbers. I believe that is the case, but I would like to confirm you with you to have 100% fidelity on that. Okay. All right. So we will follow up on that. Um, Ms. Russell, do you have anything you want to add that you're focused on working on in the next immediate period? Um, no, I just I want to emphasize that I am trying my best um, to keep the dogs under control. And out of the nine orders that were requested by the town, I believe I have completed the seven. Uh, the ones excluded are the insurance, which um, you mentioned that uh, my uh, uh, home insurance seems to cover it, seems to comply, and actually six. So this should be um, uh, one completed also if the insurance covers. And the other two is just waiting on um, neutering Axel, um, scheduling it, and um, evaluation from Dr. Bright. So the rest are, we're, we're very serious about it and we're trying our best. And in regards to the front yard, um, I sent a picture of all what I really physically can do, which I secured the front door. The front door is a, a self closed now that even if someone opened it, it will slam by itself. And there is a gate on it. I. I can't fence the front yard or the front because the door, it doesn't, ma it doesn't you know, like make any difference if I fence the front, uh, the front yard because it's already fenced from, you know, like from the back. And the one that <laughs> is to secure the front door, which I tried to do it with a gate. If I want to fence in front of the front door, that will block my driveway and that's not going to be possible physically to do it. Um, so that's all what I want to do when I say. All right. Um, Ms. Rizzo, thank you for that. I, I do uh, note that those are items four and five, the two appointments that are to be conducted. Um, so we will look to understand whether your homeowner's uh, policy complies with what we requested. The okay. most important things, though, that you can do that, that will be useful to all your neighbors are items one and two that relate to securing your dogs on your property. And um, those are the areas that we continue to be most concerned about. And I, I do note, uh, for example, item three, all right, that says you will be, Axel will be secured and humanely muzzled and restrained by an adult with a chain or other tethering device, having yeah. a minimum tensile strength of 300 pounds and not exceeding three feet in length. 
So we but have while saw is a restraining device is clearly well in excess of three feet in length. It's not clear to me that it meets the tensile strength demands. All right. I think we need to have a better understanding of that. I, I do think when you look at three removed from the premise. So I think there's a difference. I would interpret it as oh, that a, when removed, if removed okay. from the house compared right. to the back. But the issue that we had with the tether in the back is that I, I can't see how it's secured. It's right. duct tape around the top, which yeah. is a concern for us because those dogs are strong and could could easily pull that off. So so the next time maybe that Axel needs to be in the back, maybe both Axel and Maya will need to go out at the same time if in fact they need to be kept together. All right. Um, what I would like to do is can propose that we continue this hearing. Um, I know I that that we are all concerned about the continuings of these hearings, all right, but that we will continue it uh, at a date to be set as soon as possible after we understand and have information from you following the consult and the behavior evaluation appointment. Um, I would really like to receive results from that the week after those appointments. Um, and then we will set a date when we would ask you to return. Perfect. Does one, that make yeah, sense? That, that's perfect. Just one thing I wanted to add is that the, the, the tape, the duct tape, I didn't understand what the officer was meant by the duct tape because I have that leash outside um, and uh, it's it's secure to, to the rail of the deck. So it's not duct taped. And uh, I yeah, usually, I can't tell. Sorry? And I got it actually with a strain. <laughs> Hundred uh, pounds, and we don't leave him outside anyways now because, like you said, it's 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 hot, and only in the evening if I want to go sit outside, you know, like work, I just get them outside, muzzled, you know, like in with supervision next to me. Um, but it's not duct taped. Madam Chair, Mr. Barali, um, you know, if you read the order number one. And I know you say that you're not doing this now, but this picture is clearly a violation because it says that when it's access confined outdoors, it has to be in a securely enclosed and locked pen or dog run area. Um, and then it says what the pen or dog run shall have, secure roof, um, fence, et cetera. And clearly what I'm seeing from this picture, I know there is a tether law that was cited um, in the incident report um, that I think that would, I'd also like to look in the future uh, to see uh, how this tethering law applies to you, because clearly I think that is another violation. So I think we are all are just getting frustrated. Um, you know, this, I'm looking at when this started here, March 14th, the complaint um, was presented to the board. And it just seems like every time that we meet something. Well, and that was the second. The one, second right? one, right. So, something has I'm, changed. I'm, I'm sorry. This is my dick. It's still confined to the premises. So he's not outside There's, the premises. I'm not going to argue with the order. I'm just going to, if you look at number one, um, it also has to have a roof, um, a secure roof, et cetera. Such pen or dog run, yeah, he'll have a secure roof. Um, so so I'm, I'm not, I have the, the floor right now. Thank you. Um, so yes, I agree we should continue this, um, but I think there should be monitoring of this premises as we are doing. And I give a lot of credit to the officer for going out and making sure that they're in compliance. Uh, but I am curious again about the insurance. It seems that that is uh, a trust insurance policy, not a personal policy. And also uh, on this tethering law, I'd like to see how that applies to this case. So with that, uh, Madam Chair, um, I'm fine with continuing it um, and we'll see what happens moving forward. Thank you. So the question of the tethering law is, um, would permit us in, in the event of certain violations to issue a fine, um, but it looks like it needs to be up to a third violation before we can issue a fine. And um, so at any rate, that's something we need to understand more clearly. Again, we need to ask counsel. It was something that came up today as we were discussing and seeing those pictures um, and trying to understand what the situation was. Mr. Nelson. Yeah, and I just had one thing. And looking at the picture that has the um, uh, the bowls in them, looking at the fence, when you said it was 13 feet high, were you talking about this white fence right here? Is that it? No. I think it's the drop from no. the deck. It's the drop down. It's the, the drop over the deck is okay, how I understand. Okay, got it. I, I just wanted to understand. So they're, they're hypothetically be able to hop over that, but it'd be a long fall is what you're saying. Yes. <laughs> 
Oh, the question for me? Yes. Do you want me to repeat it or did you? Yes, yes. If, if, if he wants to fall, you know, like and break the leg, probably yes. Okay. Okay. But they're, they're also, you're forgetting that they're also still in training. <laughs> they're not even crossing any gate. They're not even like, even if I go down to, you know, like by myself to the backyard, they not, I'm training them not to step into the stairs and they listening. So they still under training, okay. continuous training that you're requesting. Um, that, that's why my dad, you know, like I told my dad, you know, like if you need to get him out, you know, like just leash him, you know, like for a second, you know, like just leash him because, you know, like I don't want to get in trouble again. And that's what he did when he had to clean it up, you know, like he just put him on a leash. So even, okay. even if he decided to, 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 to jump this, you know, like uh, fall, you know, like 13 feet, he, he's still leashed on the Ms. 700 strength uh, leash. Thank you, Ms. Rizal. Ms. Fitzpatrick, I'm just uh, pragmatically trying to think through this. Um, Ms. Rizal has both appointments. Actually, it looks like I'm now realizing one, one was the 19th, right? Which is a Sunday, if I'm not incorrect. Correct. One says Monday, June 19th, and the other is so June 20th. Is the appointment maybe June 20th rather than June 19th, Ms. Rizal? I might be, it might be a typo. I'm sorry. It's June okay. 19th at 9 a.m. Right. Uh, sorry, June 20th. 19th is uh, Sunday. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, so Ms. Rizal has both appointments next week. Our next meeting is June 28th. My concern is whether we would have information from those appointments in time for June 28th. When our, our next meeting after that is July 26th, which is a long time. Dr. Bright mentioned that she will uh, send you her report directly. Yeah, but it won't give us time to. So we should have something by the 28th. Our June, our June last June meeting, right? well, at least so, an update. Yeah. How about we set up a meeting 28th? If I get the, if you get the, the report, we do it. If not, then we'll have to just. All right, so tentatively, we will continue the hearing then to June 28th. Um, Ms. Fitzpatrick will determine what time uh, it will be that evening and we will advise you. And, um, at that time, we are anticipating reviewing and understanding the results of both consults the week previously. Okay, and meanwhile, we would we would expect um, the animals to be secured, particularly Axel. So moved. Continue. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Um, yeah, I just um, I'm having a little trouble with. I appreciate the. Uh, many attempts that she's the dog owner has made to secure the, the dog i'm uncomfortable with this whole duct tape to the top of the post thing and i'm i guess i'm just thinking i don't have a dog i'm not particularly sympathetic to dog owners <laughs> either either way i i it's not my bent but having had children um, I guess I'm curious why, if if her father isn't in particularly good health, why he would supervise from inside the house, um, and maybe uh, maybe a better solution in the future, if something like this were to happen again, would be to put the dog in an inside room, say a bedroom or a bathroom, and close the door to keep the dog away. I just I just feel like while we want to give every chance, we're spending a lot of time on this. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not that I don't think it's worth it, but I, I just, I question sort of, it just seems like at every turn, I'm finding that there are sort of questionable <coughs> um, decisions being made. Um, and in this case, while I understand that there's a significant drop and that the, the place is fenced in, I question if, if her father would, if the dog left the porch or deck, if her father would really have been capable of doing anything about it. So I just, I guess I would just prefer to see that you err really 
very significantly on the side of caution because uh, we're really, I, I feel like we're really extending every opportunity here um, and I'm beginning to be uncomfortable with it. Yep. I don't disagree with any of that. Okay. Can I ask yeah. me? Um, you know what? I, I don't think so right now. Thank you. Well, uh, this is an no. accusation. This is an accusation. You can't just keep keep picking. No, Miss Russell, it's family. not an accusation. My dad, my dad has been right in a state. Now. My dad went is, is in mute? a state where he made a decision, and we can't. No. All right. You know, I think everybody is working really hard to try to figure out what the right thing is in a position where the neighborhood is quite traumatized by this, where we have dogs that have been injured, all right? We can appreciate that Ms. Razul is making her best efforts as she determines for her dogs, but I don't disagree that there are a number of um, places that are of significant concern. All right, any other discussion relative to the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, we are now continued again until the 28th. Um, I would hope that we can have all the information back from council and understand uh, again what our options are going to be at that point. Thank you for coming in and speaking this thank evening. You. Chief, thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, for the thank you Ms. Rizal. <laughs> I wanted to say that earlier, but it wasn't in time. Thank you. <laughs> All right, the next item on our agenda, if I can find our agenda, um, is the Needham Community Revitalization Trust Fund project updates. And I see we have Mr. Good here, Ms. Hale. So, oh, she walks into the room <laughs> right on <laughs> you. Timing. Perfect timing. How did you do that? I've never seen that. Good evening. <laughs> 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 Good to see you all. Good to see you. <laughs> Hi there. Hello. Hello. So um, you're here to give us an update on the revitalization trust fund and yes. the projects that you have underway. And so I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. And uh, well, <clears throat> first of all, uh, thanks to Amy for all the things that we've been doing and working through and all the, uh, the different aspects around town. Um, I'll, just because I know we have uh, new select board members and, and, uh, and some of the public, of course, uh, probably not aware, I'll give a very quick overview of the fund. Um, we started the fund in 1999, uh, and its intention was to be able to uh, help revitalize pu Needham's public spaces and bring more art into the public view. Uh, one of the underlying pieces of it was to be able to have the experience of Needham when you walk through the downtown and you walk through the areas uh, that are you know, throughout town, um, to really feel like the character of Needham. Um, when, um, back when I was uh, president of the Needham Business Association, one of the things that many people said to me is, you know, how come our town can't look like Wellesley, can't look like Natick, can't look like where these are places where they had just recently invested a whole lot of money um, doing major renovations throughout the whole thing. And, uh, you know, I'd said to them, you know, it's, it's great that they, you know, had the opportunity to be able to do that. But the reality is we don't want our town to look like those towns. We want it to reflect the character of our town. And so based on that, we started to look for the things that would really bring out the character of Needham in a variety of different ways. Things that sort of represented the uh, underlying um, philosophy of the town and, and, uh, and its uh, you know, community uh, groups and, uh, and very focused on, on families and, and that whole connection. So um, since then, uh, we have done uh, nearly 40 different revitalization uh, projects uh, throughout all different areas of the town. Um, it's got a range of uh, the sculptures you see in the town common, uh, celebration benches, which are the benches of the inlaid, uh, inlaid plaques. Um, we have uh, archways, we have uh, we restored the Willett and Chadwick Cole sign when you walk from Great Plain Avenue into there, uh, which was a very, very cool project. Um, bleaches of the Claxton Field, uh, we've done water fountains, we've done uh, uh, historic uh, um, pedestals. One was at, actually at uh, the, uh, what we 
uh, sort of call the uh, police officer's plaza, which is on Chestnut, uh, Chestnut Street, which tells the story of the, um, you know, the Needham Bank and the history of, of, uh, of uh, you know, the whole incident that happened there, which was a, you know, a, a pivotal piece of history, not only for Needham, but also in the country. So, and also we've, you know, we've worked with landlords uh, to be able to help them revitalize the facades of their buildings. Um, and uh, they would fund it, but we would, you know, help in terms of supervising how the things would come together, um, give them ideas in terms of how they could, you know, improve the, uh, uh, the overall appearance uh, and do it very cost effectively. So they could really have a, a big uh, uplift uh, for, uh, you know, very affordable amount of money. Um, the, because the Revitalization Trust Fund did not pay for those things, uh, that, that uh, our, our funds all go into the, you know, into the general um, public space uh, areas, but we could lend our expertise to help them. Um, and uh, let's see. And of course, one of the things uh, um, in, you know, conjunction with all these <laughs> projects going on is that we also uh, fund and manage the townwide uh, banner program, banner and American flag program. So, uh, um, you know, every day when you go down Chapel Street or you walk, you know, drive through any of the places in town, you get to see the, the colorful banners and, uh, and the variety of different community organizations that uh, are able to participate uh, in those programs. Um, that it, we really feel that's, you know, it's, it's a great channel to be able to have the um, incredible community groups that we have be able to be recognized um, and show some of the things that they can actually do. So. Uh, we're looking to, you know, continue to be able to have that program flourish. Um, the, 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 the great thing about this, though, is that all of this be, is possible really because of the awesome people of Needham, number one, um, because when I started the fund, I remember a conversation with John Bullion um, back at the beginning who said, uh, he said, you know, it sounds like a great idea, Paul, but, you know, there are a lot of good things that people are giving, you know, money to. Uh, it may be difficult to be able to raise any money to be able to do, you know, public space uh, revitalization. And I said, you know, John, well, I guess we're just going to find out. <laughs> and so here we are, 22 years later, <laughs> almost 40 projects later, and, and all of them are funded by basically private donations, most of them uh, from private individuals, including things like the Circle of Peace and the, the uh, Once Upon a Time sculpture in the, in the, in the uh, Town Common. Um, and the bleachers of Claxton Field, and you know, the, list, the list goes on. The, the other thing that I, I think is, um, uh, you know, really one of the other critical ingredients to all this is, <laughs> is all you. <laughs> because, you know, Kate was on board uh, with being able to start this from the very beginning. Um, and you know, the, the select board has been supportive of the things that we've done for now two decades. Uh, we work with, because it's public spaces, you know, we work with almost every department in the town um, in one way or another, you know, ranging from, you know, design review to DPW to park and forestry to park and rec and, <laughs> you know, in the finance department, and all these different areas. And, uh, and people have just been incredibly supportive. They've also um, you know, uh, come to us with, with ideas to be able to improve uh, things that they, they said, hey, you know, is there something you can do about this? Um, and uh, in a variety of groups, one of the reasons that we operate the, uh, the American flag program was because the vets um, had an, uh, a problem where their, um, their program had two problematic pieces. One was the fact that their membership was older and they, were, and they used to go out and actually put the flags on all the meters uh, throughout downtown. And, and that was becoming a real problem. The second was the fact that as SUVs became the preferred vehicle, when the cars would drive into the parking places, they would actually snap off the flags. <laughs> so, so we thought if we get them up higher, <laughs> chances are nobody's gonna be buying vehicles that are that tall. Um, so that's, and that's been a, a great cooperative program uh, for them. And, and actually the funding to be able to help us with the flag program is from the uh, Alex Prohodsky uh, Flag Fund, um, which is, uh, um, which is a, a program that has helped us be able to, you know, we replace about 50% of the American flags every year uh, because of wind and, 
you know, and those types of things. So they're a, a wonderful supporter. And his uh, his wife uh, has has continued to be our supporter for you know even after his passing. So it's great. Um, the third is of course the Revitalization Trust Fund Committee because you know we've got uh, seven members. Um, all of them have uh, you know different talents, and they also have busy lives, and uh, they've willing to dedicate a portion of their time every month, uh, basically, to, uh, to meeting, to talking about the projects, uh, to participating and helping, you know, bring them to, to fruition. Um, and, uh, and it's all volunteer. So, <laughs> you know, that's, it's, it's a huge commitment that people have taken, but, but uh, um, we've, we've been able to accomplish a lot because of that, that, that kind of thing. So you have three projects right now. What is Needham going to see coming very soon? So that was my next piece. That's a per <laughs> perfect segue. So uh, number one is that uh, this Sunday on uh, June 19th, that we're going to have the, uh, the dedication of the From Needham to the World project. Uh, this is a cool project because one of the things that came out of conversations from people like uh, Gloria Grice and, and, and a whole variety of other people was that they kept bringing up, oh, well, do you know that so-and-so person comes from Needham? You know, do they, you know, do they live in Needham? And do you know this person? And I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, this is starting to turn into a pretty big list. Maybe we should assemble a list and find out, you know, just how many of these people there really were. And it, it, it sounds like a really interesting thing. Well, we got through the list um, just as the first pass and we had 68 names <laughs> on the list and said, well, you know, we have been here for 300 years. <laughs> so, so, you know, that's, this is really great. And we thought, wouldn't it be great if especially the, the, the children of the community could be able to see examples of people who lived in Needham and then went off into the world and did wonderful things, uh, really important things, and, uh, and hopefully act as, a, as an ongoing inspiration uh, for them to go out and do the same thing. So starting on June 19th, that there'll be a, a, a changing mural um, that will change um, at least quarterly. Um, and uh, that will highlight a new profile of uh, another person from Needham who has gone out into the world and done great things. And it's a full color mural. Um, it's on the side of um, the frame for it is now installed because you know we're just about there. Uh, and it's on the side of Needham Center Fine Wines, which is uh, you know right on Chapel Street. And you know, we're, we're hoping that the public will really be excited to be able to learn about all these different people. And that, you know, if it's a, if it's a, uh, you know, a helpful connection also to the schools to do anything connected with the, with the people, um, that, you know, there, there are probably a lot of synergies that could happen that we haven't even thought of. So, uh, second project um, is the Ridge Hill mural. Uh, one of the things that we thought was we looked at the at the um, on Highland Avenue we have the large parking lot which is right next to Walgreens, and it's you know pretty much green free, <laughs> so so we thought maybe there's a way we could actually you know help create a green space um, without actually having to remodel the parking lot and and do a lot of plantings, so um, we realized that we had a real opportunity because. Um, we have an absolutely beautiful uh, conservation property called Ridge Hill uh, that's over 300 acres worth of, you know, conservation land that has great trails and it has, you know, all, all kinds of um, um, space for people to be able to enjoy. And a lot of people don't actually remember that it's there. Um, it's, it's, it's very underutilized. And so, and even in fact, you know, I would talk to people who were within the town uh, who had moved in even eight or 10 years um, and didn't even know that it was there. So we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could get a really great photograph of Ridge Hill and then create a wall mural in that parking lot that would create beautiful green space and at the same time remind people that they can go out and walk the trails and they can actually, it's there for them to be able to enjoy. And so that's basically what the Ridge Hill mural project is. Uh, that project is, uh, is co all completely approved. It's just a matter of uh, waiting for the uh, funding. So we're looking for the right, the right donors to be able to, to make that possible. Um, and, uh, you know, so we'll, and it, it will go in as soon as it's funded. So not weather permitting, <laughs> because we do it to put it on the wall. Um, the, the, the third piece is the, uh, is, is a project that I think it 
could have a lot of really positive ramifications for the town, which is the, uh, the Eaton Square Art Gallery. Uh, it's on, it, it's uh, set up to be on the, uh, on the side of what people know as the rice barn, uh, right next to the railroad tracks. And it's, it's basically, it's an outdoor art gallery that will be um, rotating art, um, you know, basically on, a, on an ongoing basis that it can actually display any artistic medium because what we do is we actually are taking high res images of whatever the particular piece of art might be um, and then uh, imaging it onto um, high color, you know, full color, full detail uh, panels, which then insert into the frames. The frames are three feet by five feet. So they're, they're highly visible if you're driving down um, or if you're stopped at the lights at, <laughs> at Great Plain Avenue. Um, it's also visible, of course, from everybody who's on the commuter rail uh, and all the people who go to walk, um, you know, past uh, that area for going to restaurants and things like that. And, you know, we just think it's, it creates a, a great opportunity for several things. One is the fact that it gets an opportunity for the, uh, uh, for the Needham Art community, which is a very active community, um, to be able to have a venue where they can be displayed on a regular basis. And you know, and have an opportunity to show off their art. Because most of the time, uh, you know, our, our whole community of, of artists are pretty much, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Um, so we thought, number one, that would be a great opportunity. So Needham artists get, uh, you know, get the first priority in terms of being able to display. Um, we also have the opportunity to bring in art from around the world uh, because of the medium that we're using. Um, and one of the things that I've been in contact with, um, uh, with, um, the office of uh, Matthew Teitelbaum, who's the director of the MFA, um, is about the possibility of being able to um, bring uh, some of the uh, art pieces digitally uh, from that, that are part of the MFA's collection and have them be also in the display. And we'll look at other museums as we go on also. So there's an opportunity to be able to do a variety of different things with this art gallery. Uh, including one of the things that would be really cool is that uh, each year, I know that Needham High School uh, has an art, uh, you know, um, I, don't, I don't know whether it's a competition or just basically, a, you know, um, an event anyway, um, where they, uh, they all create art and, you know, the top five um, could all be displayed uh, in this gallery as a, as a one month, as a 30 day show, uh, which I think, you know, the kids would get a, you know, a real, uh, kick out of being able to be in a public display with uh, this much visibility. So those are the three projects that we are uh, uh, constantly, uh, I should say, currently looking for funding for. Um, the um, From Needham to the World has a component to it because it's an ongoing piece uh, for sponsorship of each one of the new profiles. Um, so we'll be looking for um, ongoing sponsorships uh, to be able to do that. And we have you know a lot of cool people who um, you know, are going to be profiled. So we're hoping that uh, people get excited about it and, and uh, keep funding it. And uh, that's, that's basically the overview. Now, I know that you take a variety of contributions of many levels, mm -hmm. but if somebody wanted to sponsor something, what's the magnitude of the cost for doing one of each of these? Okay. Well, the, um, for the, from Needham to the World, uh, $1,295 is the sponsorship for a profile. Uh, and that includes all the graphic arts work, the production of it, and 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 uh, and you know the things that go into actually creating that piece. The uh, um, the uh, Ridge Hill Reservation is a twenty five thousand dollar project. Um, it, you know it's a it's sixty feet wide and fourteen feet high, <laughs> so, um, and it's actually it, it's actually a um, a vinyl overlay on the wall, so no damage is being done to the wall, nothing's painted onto the wall. Um, so if, you know, if uh, uh, basically if down the road, either it's damaged or it wanted to be changed or whatever, that it can be removed from the wall and, uh, and not have any damage to the, to the wall. Um, the, uh, but that project, um, it, you know, is literally, once it gets funded, it is, um, you know, uh, installed uh, during the proper weather so that it adheres properly and so on. But that's, uh, it also has just as a little thing aside on that, it also has images in it of um, which were taken um, by another Needham artist uh, that has uh, close up high res images of animals, birds and other types of 
flora, well, fauna <laughs> that uh, that are at, actually at Ridge Hill uh, in there. And then it has an image of the trail map, and then it incorporates a QR code so that you can scan it and actually get more information about Ridge Hill and, and you know the trails and all that type of information. And each one of the profiles, by the way, in the uh, um, from Needham to the World has a QR code that is uh, connected to it so that you can get an actually interactive experience by going up to it, scanning it. And then if, if the person is, you know, is around, uh, meaning alive, that uh, we will, they will be able to actually talk to you <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and explain, you know, some of the things that they've done. Um, and otherwise we'll have, uh, you know, a feature where someone will explain more of the things that the, the historical person had done. Okay. So, and if the, anybody would like to see examples of these, I'll just mention they're all in the select board packet and you can go into that and get a picture of each of them. The, fi the final project, the um, uh, uh, Eaton Square Art Gallery uh, is an $85,000 project uh, okay. for the amount of work that it goes into, you know, renovating the wall and doing the things that we need to do for that. Uh, that's a more expensive project, uh, but it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's in line with a lot of the projects that we have done, um, which are, uh, you know, actually even more expensive. So uh, we're hoping that there'll be people out there who really want to be able to help us uh, create those projects and, and bring them to life. And, and one of my missions is to be able to, uh, in 2022, get these three projects fully funded uh, so that we can either install them this year or have them on the docket for the weather uh, for 2023. Great. Amy, thank you for your work with the committee also. Is there something you'd like to add? I just wanna add that I continue to be amazed by the level of civic engagement and dedication from Paul and all of the members of uh, the Needham Community Revitalization Trust Fund. And it's really been a pleasure to staff the committee. Great, thank you. Any questions from board members? Madam Chair, thank you, Paul, Amy, and the committee. You always have such creative ideas and you just beautify the town with private money. It's terrific. Um, I guess just a comment on you know, talking about people from Needham. Um, I don't know if you've done this already. Uh, the DCA Distinguished Career Award winners from the high school, they have a list. Allison's actually present, so that's how I know all of this. And I do, <laughs> I do. I remember as a junior going to those, um, and they're amazing people from Needham who have graduated, you know, Needham High. Uh, who could be featured as well as who didn't graduate even high, which you probably have a list uh, like you were talking about as well. But I think that would be a nice source. I love the idea of all these. Um, and just lastly, um, you've talked about the funding that you're looking for. What's the plug to, what's the website or how, how can someone find out how to donate to your, to your cause? They can just go to uh, needhamma.gov yep. uh, forward slash NCRTF as a Needham Community Revitalization Trust Fund. <laughs> and, uh, and there's a donate button right there. Right. And uh, the, I, I love it when the office calls me up and says, hey, Paul, we got another donation. <laughs> so <laughs> it's great. Thank you again. Yes, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. We're, we're glad for Have the update. Thanks. <laughs> Right. That next item on our agenda is the rail trail, the Chestnut Street extension. Um, Eddie, you're coming up, and who else do we have coming with you? Uh, we have some members of our World Tech Engineering team. All right. Alan All right. and Rich. Thank you. Thank you. I feel much better with you saying that. Yeah, probably. I don't know if the PowerPoint is already. Or there, or, oh, there we go. Oh, oh, that's an older version. Or give the date. Uh, I did update that. <laughs> Not too much change except for the date. Okay. Well, good evening and thank you, Madam Chair. My apologies. I have to be rather quick, which is tough for me because you know i'm very long-winded but unfortunately i have a family engagement i have to leave for i didn't realize the actual conversation was going to go on for so long but i'm glad that it did uh so tonight uh i'm here to introduce our team and i'm joined with other members of our team uh cecilia simchak stacy mulroy and our town engineer tom Ryder. um so in FY 2020 the town received state funding to investigate options for connecting the existing rail trail to Chestnut Street. World Tech Engineering with us tonight, prepared a report and concept plans at the beginning of the pandemic. Representatives of World Tech here tonight will provide the board with a summary of the options 
extension of the rail trail to Chestnut Street, southern end of the rail trail, and construction of a new shared use path from Needham Heights to Newton are both included for consideration of the board's goals for FY23, FY24. Um, with that said, and I think the theme of the evening is nothing is easy. So I, I, I ask tonight for the board to keep an open mind. Uh, all these concept and phases have some pros and cons that I think that World Tech will explore and identify. Um, if it was easy, I think it'd already be done. But I think tonight we talk about the options that we have. And I think lastly, I'd like to say that, you know, we've had the, the rail trail several years. We built the rail trail many years ago. It's a great amenity for town, but I think we all realize that it, we need more. Connectivity and accessibility are huge. We're hearing that every day. And I think this kind of takes us to that next level. Uh, obviously the board knows that we're in discussion with the state and Dover and others about extending and making this rail trail connect to other things that will really get the juices flowing and get that connectivity. But as well, this is connectivity in really the multimodal transportation side of things so that we can get people that might want to come to Needham from the train and get right on the path and, and spend a day in town. So I think it's all very important and uh, I wish it were easy, but I think tonight, again, with us tonight are the representatives from World Tech that are going to walk us through their work and, uh, and I appreciate and look forward to the board's feedback and, and again, trying to get this moving forward in the future. With that said, I, I apologize. Uh, I do have to step up. Okay, okay great. Have a good I, I do uh, agree with your assessment that this one wouldn't meet the criteria for called shovel ready, um, but we'll hear about the options. All right, so who's going to take right, us through? Well, good right. evening. Thank you. My name is Rich Benevento. I'm the president of World Tech Engineering. I'm with Alan Cloutier tonight. Uh, Alan's a professional traffic operations engineer and a professional engineer. Um, as Eddie mentioned, uh, we did the study 2019-2020. Um, it was really a um, uh, concept level uh, design. We did do some aerial survey just so we could get an idea of grades and things like that. There's some significant ledge within the corridor and, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and it was really a connection to uh, Chestnut Street and uh, Needham Junction. Um, there's a couple of concepts that we're going to show you tonight. Um, I, I, I was amused by Eddie's comment about nothing is easy th these days, uh, particularly when um, a project is dealing with an agency such as the MBTA. Um, and we have, uh, we've had conversations with them. Um, there are some things that we can do. There are some things that we definitely cannot do. And then there's some areas in the middle we're going to try and negotiate, right? Uh, Alan's going to go through uh, our study in detail, uh, and we'll talk about that. Um, we'll talk about costs, uh, what this thing looks like in terms of cost, uh, and then just next steps, talk about next steps. Um, um, Eddie did mention also about connectivity. Um, complete streets is a big thing now. Every city in town, I shouldn't say every, nearly all cities and towns in the Commonwealth have adopted complete streets policies. Uh, it's all about accommodating all users, no, not just vehicles, but in this case, pedestrians and, and uh, cyclists as well. So, so we're going to talk about that and uh, answer your questions. We have time for 80 or 90 questions. Uh, <laughs> you may, but I think this board has other things to do. <laughs> uh, but no, I'm going to let Alan get right into it and um, feel free as we're going through it, um, just to ask questions and, uh, and then we'll see where it goes from there. How's that? Okay. No. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so I actually sent over a newer file. Again, as I mentioned, pretty much the only thing that changed was the date, but I guess this is a good little introduction was we uh, presented this to a number of the people in the town, a lot of department heads on March 23rd of 2022. Uh, we can go, I'll just... There we go. Um, just the agenda, basically what we have for the presentation, a little bit of introductions. We're going to go over the previous concepts, and that is split up into three different sections the from where it currently ends to high rock street high rock street to chestnut street and then what are we doing once we get to chestnut street because ultimately we want to connect this all the way to needham junction um and then we left some space for discussion um the there's the town of needham there's different people here although we still have kate is here um and then with world tech again we have rich and myself we'll go to the next slide um, so 
<clears throat> the new section, it really, it's important. It provides a great connection from the existing trail to Chestnut Street and ultimately to Needham Junction. Um, so not only is it going to be a recreational, it actually connects a number of the things in town. You can get to public transportation from this trail. Um, so it's really also, it provides a non-motorized alternative. Um, of course, when we presented the slide, gas wasn't five dollars a gallon like it is now too. So um, going forward, it even becomes even more important to give people those different options. We can go to the next slide. Um, so we met with the MBTA, and this was critical because we needed to know what we can do out there. Um, ideally, it would have been great if we could have just ripped up the tracks and put in a trail. That would that would have been great, um, but it's not going to happen. So the kind of my first question was what can we do? Can we get rid of any of the tracks? And the answer was no, absolutely not. Um, they don't use it too much, but they need that to be able to, if they have an incident and they need to get a train by another train, that's one of the only locations where they can do it. Um, so when I was out there, I mean, we had plants growing up, you know, nothing had been over there in, in quite a while. Um, but removing the tracks was, it was a non-starter. So that was good to know. Would, would have liked to have a different answer, but it was great to know. Um, so they require the access, the entire length of the track. Um, so they're not amenable to sharing the area with bikers and pedestrians, any type of shared use. Um, because when they, if they do need to bring a train through, you know, it would require flaggers to get people off. It, it was, it was again, not an option. So what is an option is essentially to put up a fence between the tracks and where the trail would be. Um, that's something that they're amenable to. Now, normally they require a 10 foot, um, offset. So the fence would be 10 feet from the center of the tracks. And then from there you build, you know, usually do a two foot shoulder and then you build your trail. Um, they have allowed eight or nine foot offsets as well. Um, and if this was a, you know, a, a rail actually being used, we would probably definitely want to stick with that 10 feet or if it's higher speed even more. But I mean, if you've been out there, it's, it's not being used, you know, occasionally they might park a train there. So the eight feet has to get approval from them. But during the meeting, they said that that's something that they'd likely to be amenable to. Um, so we actually uh, provided some of the concepts for, I guess, a couple different conditions. If we use the eight feet, if we use the 10 feet. Um, and then not to spoil what I'm gonna say, but um, also the trail width, usually 10 feet is the preferred width. You can go down to eight feet, uh, you know, start getting a little more congested, but we're in some tight areas. So I'll get into that in a little bit. You know, the next slide. Um, just to kind of show you a little bit of the project area, I colored them because what we're doing there is different for each of the segments. So in kind of that yellowish down below is about where it ends to High Rock Street. And then you got a reddish from High Rock Street to Chestnut Street. And then blue is really, um, you know, what are we doing on Chestnut Street, really up to Needham Junction. Uh, although we really didn't bring it over too much into the train. Once we figured you got across Chestnut Street, you're, you're, you're good to go. Just the parking lot there. You can go to the next slide. We took survey, we actually use a drone based survey, it actually was able to get, you know, fairly accurate. Um, and we did it from High Rock Street to Chestnut Street, um, you were able to get the parcel lines, the wetlands, railroad tracks, uh, the railroad tracks is probably the most important, the edge of the pavement. So, um, you know, going forward, there might be some more survey that would be needed later on, but that's something that was very capable for where we are at that stage of design. Go next. So the first section, there's really only one side for this one because there's really not much for alternatives. Um, there you go. You get to see all the, the vegetation that's really growing up. Uh, there's only one segment here. Um, there is a lot of ledge that is right to the side of that. Um, so we did a sketch uh, on, the, on the next figure where we only sketched an eight foot path and eight feet offset from the from the railroad track. So it's as narrow as we go. Um, and, and a lot of it's just the amount of material that has to be removed, even for that eight feet is pretty significant. It would just be even more. So this is an overhead um, from here. It might be a little tough to see that where the actual tracks are, um, but basically that's kind of how it, um, 
where it would go. You can, um, can you really see where the tracks are? Yeah, just, Might, you can see it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Now you can see it. <laughs> um, so it's actually kind of almost like a magenta line. They're kind of um, faded a little bit. So it would come along there. Again, really, it's mostly it's ledge that we got to remove. There's not too much on top of the ledge or, or anything like that that it's going to impact. We can probably go to the next slide. So we, we were just looking at an eight foot path there. Once you get under the bridge, actually, under the bridge, you got a bit of room. Uh, yeah, we can go right there to some photos. So you can see under the bridge, there's a bit of room there. Um, and then at the next picture up on the right is a little bit, a, a little bit past. Uh, you do start having um, some ledge that you'd have to remove. So these are just some photos that kind of show. Um, then you start having a, a double track. Yeah, so these would just kind of show the, the type of stuff you go. It's, it's kind of funny because where you start the the track or the path is low and you have to remove stuff. And then, you know, you get up a little bit and then your path is high and then you got to get down low. So it's kind of funny that you got a, a little bit of both. Um, so the lower right-hand corner, that's kind of, you can see there's a little bit of a wetland there that we're going to talk about later. Um, and the question is, how are we getting around that, round, that wetland? Are we going to the left or to the right? I think we go to the next slide. Um, so now between High Rock, Street and Chestnut Street. We have four alternatives. Basically, it's eight feet or 10 feet. And then are we going to the left or the right around the wetland? So it's kind of, you know, um, maybe I'll try to go a little faster when we hit three and four. So concept one was a 10 foot wide trail, 10 feet offset. Um, and we were going to be going basically to the left of the wetlands, goes a little bit in the wetlands. Um, we assume that you we would be needing a boardwalk through here. We have not talked with Conservation Commission or anything like that yet. Um, so obviously it would need approval from them. Our construction cost for this one was, uh, this was about 1.6 million for this section. Well, from the terminus to Chestnut Street. Does not include Chestnut Street. These are 2020 values. Um, Prices have gone up a little bit the last couple of years for construction. Um, so, I mean, you probably are automatically add on 30% on, on this, but they've also been all over the place. So um, by the time this is ready to bid, maybe it won't be so crazy too. So um, we can go to the next one or we could probably try to go through these a little quick. So this is the, how the trail would go. It goes under high rock. You can actually see there's a, um, there's a business up top that kind of has these like concrete bays. Um, although I think they were, I was hearing that they might've been changing that, right? I don't know if there's been any, anything recently that's changed on the surveys, obviously two years old, um, but it would impact, um, you know, those bays that had material. We actually have a green line that shows approximately where the slope would be. And just so we're not here all night, we can just go to the next, just kind of show how this is such a, now it goes around that curve. Again, staying 10 feet off of that path. So this is kind of what tells a little bit more. This is going on the leftish side of that wetlands. Um, instead of the dark gray, it goes to a different color because that's approximately where we uh, anticipate a boardwalk. And so again, we have other ones that show on the other side of that wetlands. And then we kind of show a little bit about connecting to Chestnut Street, but I don't want to spoil that yet. We come, come up to that in a few slides. Um, concept two was, um, this was a little bit less money, um, not much, but this is essentially eight, uh, 10 foot offset. Um, no, sorry, reduced to eight feet and an eight foot wide trail. We can probably go through these one. You can flip through from this angle. You're not going to see a whole lot of difference. I mean, you know, the edge of where our path is essentially four feet in, but at this scale, uh, we'll go quick and then we can go to the next one. This one, we didn't show a boardwalk. I don't know if this one's going to fly with the conservation commission, to be honest. So that co that cost we had said without the boardwalk, but, uh, you know, boardwalks can cost about 300,000 or so. We can go to the next one. And we have a slide at the end that kind of summarizes these all. So you're not expected to remember it all. So concept three, um, now this is back to the 10 feet, 10 feet. And when we go up, you can just skip ahead a couple slides. So it goes along. 
We now use that Eversource property and go on the right side of that wetland. So we have less wetland impacts, um, but more property impacts. Um, the overall cost is pretty close. I mean, really these are all pretty close so far as far as cost. So that's really not gonna be the deciding factor. It's gonna be more, what are we doing with the wetlands? Um, making sure MBTA would let us get away with a an eight foot um, offset in a way I feel like, hey, don't get fall in love with any of these too much because things change, you know? Um, but I think they're all, you know, they could all work, right? So we can quickly go to the next one. So cost of four, now instead of eight, uh, 10 feet, it's back to the eight. Um, so our cost estimates about 1.2 million for this one. Um, and then it comes down and then this still goes around the ever source. So it's kind of, we have four different concepts. Having four kind of matches up for the, what we're gonna deal with next, as far as how are we actually gonna get medium junction? And that wetland kind of factors in a little bit. Some of these, basically, whether we're going left or right around the wetlands, uh, blends in with what we're doing on Chestnut Street. And that's going to be, I think, more the visible component of, uh, of this, what are you know, most people seeing. You can probably go to the next slide. Oh, there's, there's your, con your summary. So <laughs> everything is kind of summarized pretty close. I mean, they range from about um, you know, 1.2 to a little over 1.6 million. Um, Couple years ago. Couple years ago. <laughs> <laughs> we can go to the next. So now on road, I think this part gets, you know, maybe even a little more interesting. So concept A was if we had the bicyclists, a bicycle on the road. So it would require widening Chestnut Street because Chestnut Street is not wide enough right now to accommodate bike lanes. Um, so total be about four feet of pavement width. Um, to really give you an extra two feet on each side. Um, we do need to make sure we're accommodating, we mentioned bicyclists, but you have a trail, it's not just bicyclists, you also have the pedestrian. So we have to make sure we have a pedestrian connection as well. Um, so that, you know, we'll see on these slides coming up how we would connect. So, I mean, all of these, we would need to have the pedestrian connection. So this one, showed on-road paths. So it showed basically us putting up a sidewalk along, going underneath the bridge. There is um, room for that sidewalk underneath the bridge right now. Um, here it kind of shows sidewalks on both sides of the road, on-road bike lanes. Here we showed a crossing really at the, right where it comes out. Um, but there's also a crossing up a little bit further at Junction Street. So if you didn't want to cross in there, you could bring a sidewalk. Make sure you have the sidewalk connection and bring them to the existing crosswalk. Go to the next slide. Concept B is if we did a shared use path along the western side of Chestnut Street. Um, so this would be you are now staying, you're staying, if you're a bicyclist, you're not really interacting with the vehicles quite so much, you're having your own uh, path. So this might, you know, some people are gonna prefer different options. Um, whenever we're dealing with bicyclists, there's always a lot of different ability levels, even just within bicyclists themselves, Never mind the needs of people who are on walking rollerblades, bringing a dog for a walk. There's a lot of different, um, different needs. So, we would actually narrow Chestnut Street a little bit to get this to fit, about two feet. Um, the path, so we have a bridge there. We're obviously not going to widen underneath a bridge. So shared use paths, as we kind of mentioned, they're usually, ideally, they're 10 feet wide. Um, you can go to eight feet, and we would have to go to eight feet underneath that bridge because um, we're not going to be moving any, any bridge walls. So this shows it on the, on the Western side of Chestnut Street. This coming here is not compatible if you were to go on the Eversource property because we wouldn't go avoid the wetland to then blast the shared use path through the wetland um, along the edge of the road. So this is where what we're doing here might kind of influence what we wanna do um, around that wetland. So this would essentially, you'd come down, 
you can then go stay on the path all the way up to the crosswalk near Junction Street. We can go to the next slide. Concept C is a shared use path on the other side of the road. So um, this one, essentially it's a longer length because we're now on the other side of uh, that wetland. And, you know, actually when we do go to it, it's a little bit more, I guess, of an impact to some people. Um, same thing underneath the bridge, it would be an eight foot wide path. This one it was now would be compatible if we were going around the wetland, we can go to the next um to the next one so if you're going around the path you would then bring people across the street and then bring them along that side um one thing that there is a lot of right away on that east side of the road um the property lines show a, a lot of right away between the road and uh people's houses that falls within the right away however um what people consider their front yard is not always the same as uh, where the property line falls. So here we actually, we showed an eight foot wide buffer where it's a thicker green. Um, seeing, you know, more recently as I'm like, oh, look, there's a driveway. Uh, uh, do I see a basketball hoop? Um, we would probably, if, if something like this was to happen, we would narrow that buffer, probably keep it more of a three foot wide buffer or something along the whole stretch to try to minimize the impact of the, on those properties. Again, it's not on the property, but I guess it could be impact to the people who live there. Um, but the path still kind of uses what uh, would be in front of the, uh, those people's houses. So this one is definitely would be something that you'd want to talk to those homeowners about. Um, I think we can go to the next slide. So this is kind of a little summary. I didn't talk about costs at all, um, but if you see concept A and B were you know, 604, again, this is 2020 numbers again. Um, concept C was more money because it's a longer stretch. Um, so that was, you know, approximately 100,000 more um, because of, again, you get a little extra length of it. I mean, we can probably go, I think, I think, yeah, I think um, from here, I don't know if we really need um, answers from this board or whatever. I think this is probably meant more to inform you. Although if, if anybody has any, thing that they want to share as far as we would definitely not want to go down that route um, would be open to hear hearing more I guess Alan one thing you, you may want to just clarify too is there were there was the cost for the path itself and then cost for the on-road piece so what you saw those were separate so, so we'd be combining those uh, those costs so roughly a two million dollar project in 2020 dollars yeah, uh, yeah, probably. I think we're probably around 2.2, 2.3 million or so. Right. Yeah. And I think for easy math, you know, <laughs> we're seeing 30% um, minimum. Where is that going to go? And generally, it doesn't go down. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, um, we, we, we have a lot of, me, you know, major projects, tip, tip kind of projects. And, it, you know, it's better to go in. It's always better to go in and have money left over than go in and say, oh, we need more. Yeah. You know, so just th something for the board to just consider as you contemplate which option or whether to move forward. So this was um, a project that the board was looking at really starting back in 2019 after the original rail to rail had been completed and open. The question was, how did this get completed to tie in? Um, there was some other discussion about it related to um, some work that a proposed uh, development down on Chestnut Street led to another set of discussions um, around this chunk of the rail trail. And of course, the question is, we're now sitting in 2022, looking at projects that are occurring at both ends of town that are rail trail related, and where does this fit in? overall as we think about our priorities so this is really intended as background for the board um, as we're headed into priority setting discussions and thinking about where these different things fit in light of other amenities i mean any of these projects are more expensive than a skate park for example you know but money's going to go somewhere what serves the greatest number of people and how do we think about that are things that this board will consider you know, okay. Did you want to make a comment, or can I ask James, who's from the Rail Trail Committee, he would like to say something? No, that's fine. Miles, do you want to bring him over? Thank you.
Hello, everyone. James Goldstein here. Hi, James. Hi. Hi. Um, if I can just make a couple of comments and then ask a question, I'll try to be brief. Um, comments, and all of my comments relate to the off-road section, not Chestnut Street. So it's it's the first half, if you will, of the presentation, um, which I uh, appreciated hearing very much. Um, from a uh, cycling standpoint and from the, the Bay Colony Wheel Trail Association uh, perspective, which I had, um, uh, an eight foot path, uh, an eight foot wide um, trail is suboptimal and for both safety and usability reasons. And a 10 foot wide path is really the minimum that we think ought to be uh, constructed. Now, that's not to say that there might be short sections um, that will require uh, um, eight feet width as opposed to 10 feet, but um, options, I believe it's um, uh, two and four with eight foot widths to us don't make sense, um, especially since there's not enormous um, cost differences uh, between those. So th that's my first comment. Um, another comment about the um, uh, usual 10 foot offset that the MBTA requires. We also had met with MBTA several times and, and um, Kate, I believe uh, you and some of the DPW folks were um, at, at, at least one of those meetings. Um, and the 10 foot offset is, uh, is used for active rail lines. And although this is technically active, as um, the World Tech folks mentioned, it has not been used for, I believe, 15 years or more. And so it's, it's, it's inactive in terms of um, uh, everyday use. And so um, we were confident when we spoke to them, and it is a couple of years ago, so it, uh, it's a while, that they would in fact approve an, an eight foot offset. And that makes a lot of sense for a variety of reasons, including it allows you to do the, the 10 foot width path um, for the trail in certain um, locations and, and uh, deal with less ledge and therefore hopefully lower costs. So that's the second um, uh, point I wanted to make. Um, uh, eight foot offset to us makes more sense assuming MBTA uh, still approves uh, and minimize the amount of ledge um, that has to be removed. If you look at World Tech's cost sheets, the ledge removal is roughly a third of the overall cost. So it's a very expensive endeavor to remove this ledge. I have some technical questions for them. Um, uh, perhaps I can ask later, but big picture, um, less ledge removal, more cost savings. Um, I, I, I guess I have a question about the wetlands issues and the um, wetlands replication numbers in the cost. You didn't talk about wetlands replications and if it's too much detail, I can hold off. Let me ask the chairwoman if, if it's too much detail. Um, A long answer, just- Well, I can give you a quick answer. Um, so we didn't, the wetlands were not flagged um, we, the, again, it was through aerial, so, so we don't know exactly what the total are. impact of yep. it was. Uh, by the way, I was a conservation commissioner for 13 years, so uh, I got out of that. Too many mosquitoes. Um, in any case, um, so they weren't flagged. Um, and so the impacts um, generally are twofold. One, what is, what is allowed? Do we have areas for, um, for replication? Uh, you know, th there may be an area where we have to disturb, we can disturb up to 5,000 square feet. I don't think we're going to need to disturb that. Um, but oftentimes, even a boardwalk going through the wetlands, certain amount of light has to get under the boardwalk. So that is a permitting issue and process that we would have to go through. Alan, I don't know if you wanted to comment no, as well. That, except that at this level, we haven't gotten into too much of that yet. Right. We kind of know there's a wetland there, try to avoid it as much as we could. We know we're probably going to have to deal with some kind of boardwalk, but really... Um, I think that's something that going forward is going to be the next level of design. Yeah, I, I understood that piece of it. What I don't understand is in your cost tables, the cost uh, for wetland replication for um, options uh, or concepts one and two was about $60,000. So higher than for three and four. And yet 
uh, concept one has a boardwalk uh, at three hundred thousand dollars, so it uh, I don't un understand why the replication would be more when you have a boardwalk to minimize impacts. That's something we could look into. Okay. okay. Um, Any other questions? Let me just take. Oh, well, um, does World Tech have? Um, well, well, I uh, I guess the the design is at the conceptual level, and there's not a recommendation um, of of a preferred option. But um, from my perspective, um, I don't quite understand uh, the advantages of the boardwalk if there's more re uh, wetlands replication required. Uh, for that option and it cost $300,000 more. We certainly want to minimize impacts um, uh, to the wetlands, absolutely. And I understand the uh, uh, Conservation Commission has a very important role here, but um, that piece of it didn't make a lot of, uh, uh, of sense to us. Um, so, so if I, so if I yeah. could just, re just respond quickly, I think one of the issues with the wetlands replication is, do we have the land and who owns the land to replicate on? So we're right next to um, Eversource. Eversource's property. Uh, so how, what's the extent of the replication? How far can we go? And, and it's, a lot of times it's not just, it, it's not just uh, area for area. It has to do with grading. It has to do with what, what type of species are there. There's all sorts of things that, that, and that can affect that. So I think we'll, what we were doing was just taking an estimate based on what we believe could be possible, what those numbers might be. Uh, but as Alan talked about before, you know, some of this may be, What's the trade-off? Do we want to go try and uh, uh, secure additional right-of-way or additional property versus trying to deal with, um, you know, what type of replication or a boardwalk or those things? So that's why we didn't necessarily have a recommendation because there's a lot of unknowns that really that, that we want to have this larger discussion like, okay, you know what, for example, the on-street portion, you know, is this going to be a non-starter if that, if that shared use path is going in front of someone's house? versus on the other side of the street where we have to narrow the path, things like that. Yeah. Okay, so um, this was a study, right? It's a very high level. It's just intended to give us some directional information right. with respect to this. It's not an active project. We're going to need to decide where, whether it will be one or not. Yep. Okay. Do you um, have do you have another question, James? Yes, very briefly, and and it relates to what you just um, said. What is the board's next step in considering this project, and what is the timetable? Because we've had um, uh, an interest in this for a couple of years now, and um, because of the departures at the DPW and Tony's death and so forth, it's obviously been backburnered, and um, we're we're quite anxious to see it move forward if it's going to. So the board will be having a discussion about our priorities and goals, and we'll be doing that in August. And at that time, we'll decide some things will stay on the list and some things will not stay on the list. I don't know where this particular project will fall relative to all the things that are on the plate at the right at the moment. So that, that's something that this board will discuss and we'll see where this goes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anything else from the board? Madam Chair, just quickly, because you asked for our input, and I, and this is very high level, as you said, I think just for where I'm, where I'm sitting here is, I would like to see the least impact to the neighbors on Chestnut Street. And we saw that on Highland Avenue, where people think they have this property, and they don't, and it's their front yard. So I think if you start with the on-road section, you say, you know what, that's the most impactful, what are the other options, and that leads you to, you know, the, the two that we're looking at on Chestnut Street. Um, so that would drive the off-road, I think, because you said those are only compatible with certain setups. Um, and I would just comment, time is money. We've tried to deal with Eversource on easement issues <laughs> and talking to them. And I think that when it sounds like a good idea, we can work around the wetlands. But practically, I think time, you're probably looking back to a concept one or concept two to make this work. Um, I guess just my question, that the question that was raised about you have a 10 and a 10 on one and you have an eight and an eight on another. Is there a split where you could do an eight and a 10? Absolutely. Some type of hybrid from that. I think so, it was to keep from presenting eight of them. Yeah, that sounds <laughs> right. So maybe, you know, um, to Mr. Goldstein's point, maybe there is a, a hybrid in there, but I think to go around and do that loop and try to get land and then replicate wetlands and talk to Eversource, I think this would really be a tough. That's bird. good input. So, Thank you. That's my input. Thank you.
Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Heidi. Um, thank you for this plan and all the work that's gone into it. Um, I, I would like to say that I feel very enthusiastic about this whole situation. Um, I think that um, this plan, wh whatever iteration it en ended up on, should it move forward, would really allow a whole portion of town that is not able to connect not only to the junction and to the commuter rail, but to Ches the Chestnut Street shopping district um, to have um, access. And I think, um, I guess, while I feel very enthusiastic about this, I, I do have a couple of questions. Um, that I'd, I'd love for you to think about as we move forward into the next iterations. Um, one is that I think that this could be a viable uh, transportation option for folks who want uh, to bike to the commuter rail um, and then take that into town. And um, so I guess I, I would say, I would love to see this be something that could use year round use. Mm -hmm. And um, while I understand that that's not something that we do a ton in this area. Uh, there are countries all over the world that do this on a regular basis. So I'd, I'd like to, to have us think about using materials that are appropriate for wintertime use and also how we would, you know, for example, clear snow. Um, I'm also concerned about the safety on the Chestnut Street portion. Um, right where this bike path would be is right where people frustrated by the slow uh, transit down Chestnut Street start to speed up right as they go into that bridge. And so I'm, I really wanna make sure that when we talk about a bike path there, that it's really something that's protected, but also that we recognize that a bike path there, it, um, it would be a natural extension to bring that into town so that, so that if we think about building a bike path that we also think about like what the future of that bike path and that street would be, so that it's something that we could make viable going into the center. Cause it wouldn't really make sense to build something that had to stop there. And then that the bikes couldn't go further into town. We, we generally look at that as having a logical beginning and a logical end. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I do think that, you know, the stores would really benefit from this access. It brings a whole new group of folks into town on bikes. And given that we're, you know, about to embark on a parking study and potentially some new development with MBTA guidelines and so on and so forth. I mean, it just seems to me that this is a really nice way to reduce traffic, to reduce parking need. We know that that MBTA uh, parking station there is constantly having issues with people not being able to park there because there just aren't enough spaces. Um, so I just, um, I'm just hoping that we can consider this as an option, both for recreation and really for useful transportation year round. And I just, hope that we can build that into a plan should we be fortunate enough to have this move forward. Thank you. And, and of course, I'll just note that one of the things about that parking lot that we know is that it's filled often with people from Dover. Ah. So getting access to Dover will be a critical piece so they could bike that would be great. to the junction. Mm -hmm. Kevin. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really excited about this project. Everyone, you know, we want a, a, bike, a bike society. Um, but we have to kind of build it. And we need, this is one of the ways we encourage that to happen. Um, on the chestnut portion, Matt's perspective was very interesting, but I would also, but I would <laughs> help to perhaps, but the but. I think if we went on to the other side, because there's a commercial driveway between the two bridges, and I don't know if that'd be a hazard for X number of cars going in and out that would probably be crossing that bike path. But if it's on the other side, you wouldn't have that problem. Mm -hmm. um, that's just my two cents. But I love this, where this is going. I really hope this comes to fruition. Thank you. As, as part of the follow-on uh, would be additional traffic data that would be collecting as well. What is the volume of traffic on the road? Where are folks turning? Where are they pulling in? Where are they pulling out? Because while all of these types of projects are important for connectivity and recreation and transportation, they have to be safe. Yeah. Uh, and that's really the key. You know, Chestnut Street, pretty busy, right? Um, you know, having appropriate crossings, having appropriate signage and advanced signage and all that sort of thing has to be part of the project because you can't just put this thing down and then hope for the best. You know, you have to make sure that it's as safe as possible. And I know at that commercial driveway, I think there's been a number of things that have been floated over the years, right? I think a 40R was being considered there a few right. years yes. back, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's something that even if uh, further down the line, if, if if this gets built over there and you know a bit later 
the uses change and you have more people uh, turning in and out, you know, exactly how that design is designed will be important to try to make sure it does safe. You know, you don't have a really wide turn up. We want to make sure people are taking slow turns in and out of the driveway, get good visibility. It'll be something to keep in mind. Absolutely. Great. Thank you for coming in. We appreciate the update well, thank you on for having us. So yeah. and the work Enjoy on the, the project. And um, <laughs> yeah. we're There'll glad it's kept thanks. you busy during the pandemic. You know? hey. <laughs> right. All good. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is the proposed alcohol regulation changes as they relate to breweries. Yep. Thank you, Stuart. And we have Amy and Katie back with us. Thank you. You have been patient as uh, I notice it's now seven o'clock. <laughs> so. Just about. Just about. Yeah. No, I apologize. We didn't bring any samples with us for this discussion. Yeah, it would have helped at this point. So. Okay. Do you want to? Yeah. You, you can tag team wherever you would like. Okay, great. If we have here as well. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board. And so I do note for members of the board that if you're freed is on Zoom, she is our legal counsel on this matter from Maris and Harrington. Yes, right. exactly. Um, and I would just add as well that um, Chris Heap and Lee Newman, who aren't with us, um, have contributed greatly uh, to this work as well, along with Amy and Miles. So I thank them for all of their work and the future work that's going to come. Um, so for tonight, um, just by way of context for the public, um, as you all know, as the board, um, in the fall, this board met with the planning board and talked about the economic development opportunity of um, allowing breweries to locate in Needham. Um, from that discussion, the planning board undertook a zoning amendment process. And their piece of this puzzle is really to define what is a brewery as a business type, bless you, and um, where could those uh, businesses be located in town, um, either as a right or by special permit. Um, the select board's component of this is um, licensing the um, sale of alcohol, the service of alcohol, and we'll get into the details of that. Um, and so really we're kicking off that select board process tonight um, with the hopes that um, we'd have this concluded and the planning board zoning article amendment um, ready for the fall town meeting and town meeting members would have a fuller view of the of the proposal. And I was just going to say what did happen as people will remember was the planning board pulled their proposal because it was felt right. that people wanted to understand the whole package of how it would all work. Yeah, exactly. So, thank you. Um, so just to give you first a sense of timeline, so process, um, what we're thinking, our goal for tonight is to really just provide foundational information and there's a lot of it. So um, Ivria will be our backup on all the technical questions. Um, but, um, and we have a couple of specific questions that um, if you have feedback tonight, I, we're all ears, but if you want to um, subsequently send it to us, we have some time. Um, I'd recommend that we do a public hearing on this at your next meeting in June. Um, and then um, we'd have a full month to digest what we hear for your July meeting. If the board feels ready to vote on an updated policy in July, great. If not, we have time. You can wait till the August meeting. Um, and just to note that the planning board will have a parallel process happening. They basically have to restart the zoning amendment process leading into town meeting. So starting in July, they'll start posting their hearing notices. Um, and Do they'll- they have to refer it back to us? Does it like start over at that stage? It does, okay. yeah. So they will um, start that process in July. And I anticipate at your July meeting, they'll- this board will have to accept and refer the zoning article back to the planning board. They'll finalize the language in September before the warrant closes. Um, so, so that's process wise. So I want to dive into um, some content. Um, first, just to talk about what the planning board has proposed in terms of definitions of brewery types. Um, so if you want to look at the actual language, it's both in the memo and um, the draft zoning article um, is also in your packet. Um, I'm not going to read the definitions verbatim, but I think the biggest takeaway is that the planning board has set up kind of a two uh, tier 
lack of a better term, um, system where there's two business types. There's brew pubs, which you should think about as primarily it's a restaurant that also happens to brew beer. Um, and so for me, sadly, this place is closed, but I always think of John Harvard's yes. <laughs> at Shoppers World in Framingham yes. or in uh, Harvard Square. And um, so that to me is kind of the, the brew pub um, type. Um, so the second business type is microbreweries, and this business model is that they primarily are manufacturers of beer. They sell it for on and off premises consumption, and food is really a secondary um, component of their business, which they may or may not do at all. And again, we'll get into that. Um, so Castle and Brewing in, in Norwood, and Night Shift in Everett are two th that come to mind. I'm sure there's so many. They've been proliferating, so I'm sure you've seen others. Um, so that kind of framework of these two business models is going to repeat itself when we dive now into the li liquor licensing piece. Um, so just to start by saying anyone that wants to manufacture beer first has to get a federal permit. So there are no fly by night beer manufacturers. Um, it is a heavily regulated industry. Once they get a federal license, they have to come to the state to the Mass Alcoholic Beverages Control Commission, the ABCC. The state function through the ABCC is really three things. They are issuing licenses, one, to regulate how um, that business is manufacturing the beer. They are regulating <laughs> how um, that business is selling beer for off-premise consumption. Um, so this board will not have any say or licensing over breweries off-premise consumption sales. So put a pin in that. The third thing that the state law um, decides for us is depending on what state level brewery license an applicant gets determines what path they come to the select board. Um, and I'll, I'll explain this. I'll walk through it um, a little bit more detail. So fundamentally, the role for this board is to license for on-premise consumption sales, um, both for brew pubs and microbreweries. Um, so yeah, so the function for the select board is to issue licenses for the on-premise consumption of alcohol. So I'm going to ask if folks are visual learners like me, pull up this chart, and I'm going to walk through. Um, this is in your packet. Um, it helps at least me keep straight all the pieces of the law. So what you're looking at here, um, the green is existing um, local regulations. The blue is all related to this brewery discussion that we're having. So it's all proposed. I just want to um, walk through step by step because um, I think it provides the best foundation. So um, first, starting with package stores um, under the state law, which is Master General Law Chapter 138, package stores uh, are regulated under Section 15. Here locally, the select board issues a section 15 license to them, either an all elk or a wine and malt um, for package stores. Um, we have a limit of how many of these licenses we can issue. That's our town quota. Um, so yes, there is a, a section 15 quota. Um, under section 15 licenses, the package stores cannot have sell for on-premise consumption, um, but they are selling for off-premise consumption. I'm gonna on, uh, purposefully not talk about food. So let's jump up to restaurant. So for restaurants at the state level, they are ruled under section 12. Locally, this board issues a section 12 license to them. Again, um, the applicant can choose either that they're applying for an all elk or just a wall, uh, wine and malt section 12 license. Um, there is a quota for Section 12s as well, so we have a limit of how many licenses we can issue. So under a Section 12 license, um, restaurants can serve uh, for on-premise consumption, and this board makes decisions about what that looks like uh, through the local regulations. Um, if we were having this discussion two years ago, I would have said Section 12 does not allow for off-premise consumption, but because of the pandemic, the state did the to-go cocktail alcohol uh, rules. And so for right now, at least temporarily or until the state decides otherwise, um, under section 12, there is some off-premise consumption allowance. Um, 
Although I'd say that's fully regulated at the state level, not through the local license. So then we pivot to um, talking about the two brewery types, first brew pubs. Um, so under the state statute, we're still under chapter 138, um, but the um, section is 19D, pub brewery license. Um, and again, in the, under the state uh, ABCC laws, they have these two um, licenses, 19D, and I'll talk about 19C for microbreweries. And it really mirrors um, pretty closely uh, the distinction that the planning board's zoning definitions make. So again, um, brew pubs licensed under 19D pub breweries really are those restaurants who also happen to make beer. Um, so keep that in mind. State law requires that if an applicant gets a 19D from the ABCC, um, that then when they come to us locally, they have to get a section 12 to um, serve for on-premise consumption. Um, and again, they can choose to apply for an all elk or a wine and malt. Again, because they're getting a section 12, this falls towards the town's quota. Um, and um, the section 12 allows for the on-premise consumption. Um, they can sell for on-premise consumption, both what they make and alcohol from other sources because they have a section 12 license. So they could get wine and hard liquor from some other producer and sell it on site. And they would also be selling the beer that they produce. In terms of, yeah. Yeah, um, just looking at, Sorry, maybe I'll let you finish first. Go ahead. Sure. <laughs> I know. It, I know it's a lot. <laughs> um, and so for brew pubs, um, again, because these are beer manufacturers, it is under the ABC's C's jurisdiction to decide off-premise consumption. So um, yes, they can sell for off-premise consumption and that is entirely under the ABC's purview. Um, I just note they have a volume cap on how much they can sell direct to consumers um, for two gallons <laughs> um, and the to-go alcohol um, allowance for restaurants applies to them as well because again, they have the exact same license as restaurants do. Um, so um, jumping to the last column, microbreweries, um, under the state law, uh, 19C is a farmer brewery license. Again, that's their terminology for what we're thinking about as microbreweries. Um, and so if an applicant goes to the state and gets a 19C from, a, from the ABCC, they would then come to the select board and the option for this board is um, that you would have to issue them a 19C farmer series pouring permit. Permit and license, think of it as the exact same word. Um, it's just a technicality, but it functions the same way. The town's regulations do not have farmer series pouring permits in them right now. So that's what we'll get to at the end of this discussion. Of note, um, 19Cs do not hit the town quota. This is part of why we've seen such a growth in the sect sector generally. Um, and so um, even the changes with the home rule petition, um, adding farmer series pouring permits is really separate from that discussion we just had at town meeting about um, the home rule petition and, and having more licenses in town. So for microbreweries, um, that 19, C uh, license issued by this board would allow for on-premise consumption, um, but they can only sell and have people consume on site what they make. They can't bring in outside um, alcohol. And for off-premise consumption, yes, again, they can do this, but that would be determined by the ABCC. Um, so I'm gonna stop there and say, everything I just walked through is not discretionary. That is the foundation provided by State, state law, um, but that gives us the framework by which we're then making recommendations um, to this board about our local policies. So stop for questions. Yes. Yeah. Um, for the last part with the microbrewery, as far as they're able to, um, the, I'm just trying to frame it the right way. As far as what they're able to consume, is there any kind of limit to how much they're able to give them in while they're there in like one sitting because then them getting home or whatever that may be do we have any regulation with that in this form 
or no? Well, they still, I'm sure, must be tip certified and trained and have all okay. of that going on. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, definitely. It's not like they can make everybody drunk and they're not worried about that. Thing. <laughs> yeah, so I know. I'm just like a... to over -serve. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. okay. Yes, that's still there. <laughs> you mean? Yeah, you mean for consuming on site? Yeah. Yeah, everything okay. would still apply, mm -hmm. and um, we can talk through in the local regulations. Okay. We want to make sure there's complete consistency around training requirements All and, the same standards yes, of and yes okay. but yes very good question any other questions on yes if i may um just miss braille i know we just applied for additional license so um I hope we applied this... for the statutory number that the town would be entitled yes to. yes exactly thank you <laughs> Madam Chair. one more than we have which is one more than we have do we have any of the of the licenses that we have do are any of them currently free i mean do we have we have section 15 one no more or no we need this but section next... 12 we have plenty section 12 we Sec have... restaurants we have plenty okay section 15 we we're out. Or our, the our, the package stores. Our, the package stores. Oh, the package stores. Okay, the restaurants are back. Okay, great. Thank you. That was my question. <laughs> Thank you for explaining that. Um, I was reading this stuff, and uh, it seemed like the distinction without a difference. But thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ibria. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. All right. Okay. okay. So, Let's pivot now then to what we are proposing at this point for updates to the town's regulations. I think it's probably um, best if you want to take a look at the red line of the actual regulations. Um, so let me just say foundationally, because we have this brew pub, microbrewery, um, two bucket system, both in the zoning, then again at the state level, our recommendation to you mirrors that for updating your regulations. Um, and we foundationally were thinking about brew pubs as um, fundamentally restaurants, and but likewise thinking about microbreweries as fundamentally a completely different business model. And so that's the basis for our, our staff recommendations to you. Um, for what's being presented. Um, again, because we wanna treat brew, brew pubs just like restaurants, you're not gonna see a lot of changes in um, these regulations. We basically are saying everything under section 12 applies to a brew pub. Um, so it's pretty straightforward and you won't see a lot of policy change in the red lines. Um, what a lot of the markup is, is adding farmer series pouring permits to the local regulations. And this is what would be issued uh, to microbreweries for their on-site consumption. Let me highlight three. Sorry, Katie, oh. can I just make one comment about what you just said? Um, so as Katie said previously, uh, brew pubs uh, licensed by the ABCC are required to obtain a section 12 restaurant license from the local municipality. So it's not that they are being licensed at the local level level in a way that's similar to a restaurant. They actually are a restaurant under your licensing scheme. So the license they hold is exactly the same as a license that a restaurant would hold. Mm -hmm. To the extent you want to put additional conditions on them, they would those conditions would have to apply um, also to a Section 12 restaurant license. Great. Thank you for that clarification. Um, so we have I'd say three questions that came up most to us as staff in terms of wanting feedback. And of course we welcome your feedback on all of the red lines. Um, but if um, you wanna turn to section 10 in the red line um, version, this is really our initial proposal around these farmer series pouring permits. The three areas where um, we didn't make explicit recommendations in policy language. The first is section 10.3. And this is really a question of, does the board want to um, place limitations on how the floor space of a microbrewery is used? So under section 12, um, the board's regulations talk about limiting the bar service area of a restaurant to 15 seats or 20% um, of the total seats. Uh, again, that's restaurants and brew pubs. So this is a different business model. Um, but um, I think the question is, um, 
for microbreweries, you, you could say you wanted seats as opposed to just standing area in a certain percentage of the floor space. You could stay silent and kind of not overregulate um, that decision for microbreweries. Um, so again, we're open to feedback now. Um, if you want to give us some thought, because this is a lot, we've got time um, to hear it um, in the coming weeks and months. So I, I, my sense was I would probably keep it the bar seating similar to other restaurants. So that's my initial thought. For microbreweries. Um, for microbreweries. Okay. I, other people may feel differently, but it seemed to me to make sense that there would still be some bar seating that would have that would not be without limit. Madam Chair. Okay, and I'm presuming from what I understood here um, that the microbrew can make a decision to have other tables, right, in the area. Um, but we're just talking about specification as it relates to the bar seats is your question. Um, yeah, let me clarify just so I understand what you're saying. I think for a microbrewery, the distinction between the bar area and what's not a bar area um, is, is not always as clear as at a restaurant. Um, so I think the question for the board is, do you, do you want to make distinctions about um, these portions of the... So an area for consuming on site yep. could versus be standing room the production only. area. It could be tables. It could be, um, you know, a chained area where somebody can walk up to a food truck. You know, there's a lot of models of what it could look like. So um, the, the select board policy could be as permissive or not. Right. Okay. Madam Chair, yes, if, if I may, um, and I'm not being facetious. I know when we had liquor stores come to Needham, we actually did a couple of field trips to certain ones to see how they would fit in. I'm not a beer drinker, so, but I hear, you know, the Trillium and other places that people love and they go and how they're laid out. And it's my understanding that they have picnic tables and it's pretty wide open. So I guess I would be supportive of kind of letting that business decide how they want to run instead of coming and saying, these terms don't work for us. So just on that, I know we're gonna get into food trucks and food later, but um, I think it would be wise for us to maybe individually or you know, a couple of us to go and see how these other places are set up or maybe just get a floor plan because without that, it's hard for us, I think, to, to understand the concept if we're not familiar with it. But I just wouldn't want to over-regulate and they say, this isn't really um, a micro um, brewery, the way it's set up, it's more of like a, a restaurant out in a in a section of town that is more conducive to having the microbrewery there. So, thank you, Mr. King. Well, thank you. I've never been to a bar before, but um, no, I'm supposing I don't know how they're going to want to set up. Would this be? Would they do a hall rental? Would there be a functions? Would it be standing room in one night, or in perhaps tables in the next? So, uh, perhaps a field trip to Trillium. Yeah. I mean, if we have to. I mean, I'm a public servant. <laughs> I say to um, Amy, if you want to speak to, we were trying to figure out what other communities have done. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> this is not going to be. Yeah, I've actually spent helpful, um, a fair amount of time uh, researching breweries. In, uh, <laughs> <laughs> somebody has to do the hard research. And, you know, primarily, you know, they are. Um, our, our function so that the space is is very versatile in, in that you know if they have like for for example Trillium I mean that that's sort of the Taj Mahal of of, of breweries quite honestly um, you know they've got a whole restaurant section but then they have a whole sort of you know lounge section with a they have function room so that may not be the best example to to use um, but quite honestly for the most part having space that can really be easily adaptable based on the kind of activities that they're having, whether they're having live music or um, a trivia night or cornhole tournament, that sort of thing. Um, I think flexibility is going to be really important to these types of businesses. Thank you. Sounds fun. And correct me if I'm wrong, we didn't find any comparable communities that had any specifics in their That's correct. Licenses. I mean, in the regulations. Yeah. yeah. Um, the next kind of big question um, is around food service. So this is section 10.6. Um, and so really the question is, 
um, do you want to require microbreweries to provide or have available food and to what extent? So what is in the red lines right now, um, again, thank you, Ivria, um, are options. So you could go all the way from the kind of most uh, um, biggest requirement to say the microbrewery has to have a common victuallers uh, permit and run a full kitchen themselves. Um, you could have um, that the microbrewery could have an agreement in place with somebody with a CV or a food truck or a restaurant nearby. Um, you could allow patrons to bring food in from outside. Um, you could do a combination of those things, or you could be silent on food requirements. Um, so I think this was the area where, you know, we, we provided many of options and we'd love your thoughts. Marcus. Yeah, so I was looking at um, option two, out or can we do it and or like they have a kitchen or have that possibility and then for special events or something bring in a food truck? Is that something that's a possibility? I'm just speaking out loud because I feel like to have that option is great. Um, but they also not limit them from to wanting to bring a food truck or something for a cornhole tournament or something like that, where they don't want the huge crowds inside and the more the focus is outside or yeah. just thinking out loud. Yeah, I think you could pick multiple of these options, oh, okay. um, definitely. And I, I would just say, um, you know, our discussions with staff about if we require them to have a CV and have a fully operational kitchen themselves, um, that really is... Um, taking them away from that difference between why are they a microbrewery as opposed to a brew pub. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so I'd say, um, you know, my recommendation is that we not require option one. They certainly could have a CV in a full kitchen if they wanted to, but to require right. that, um, I think we'll hear a lot of feedback from um, microbrewers about that. Um, my, my sense would have been just that I think there's a requirement that food be available and kind of how it's available I'd probably be willing to leave largely open, but, and, and up to them, whether that is by putting in a restaurant, by choosing to have, let people order in from the place next door, you know, put in a food truck, or even if they want to permit people to bring food there, I mean, that's their choice. I just think food should be available if alcohol is served. Yep. Yes. So. <laughs> Yeah, I think there was maybe some public safety value to having food. And I also think it might create, it changes the tenor of the place. If it's just about drinking, that encourages, that'll just be a different mindset. So I like food might be good. Yep. Madam Chair? Yes. I, I agree. I think if you leave it up uh, to them and food ha has to be available in some way, shape or form. And don't forget there's going to be a special permit process so that's going to be vetted as far as how things are laid out and i agree with you um when you talk about you know you're not uh you know you're a microbrewery you're not a brew pub you're out in a different area which would be fine for food trucks if you were down here in the center of town we had the whole food truck discussion it wouldn't be so i think the location based on the zoning um supports food trucks or light food or bring in food but i would leave I, I agree i would leave that up to the the uh, owner of the premise of the the microbrew great so the last item is section 10.7 and this is around allowing the sale of pitchers the town's current regulations are silent on pitchers, um, which um, means that they're allowed because they're not prohibited um and but from a practical perspective, because with a microbrewery, a sale of a pitcher is probably a, a more realistic option. Um, we want to explicitly raise it to the board uh, to see if you want um, to allow sale of pitchers at microbreweries or, or any of the establishments. I have no problem with pitchers. Same. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, that um, I guess I will just touch on fees, um, just so we don't forget it uh, and lose it along the way. Um, so there's a fee schedule um, uh, in front of you. I'll just say for context, as a reminder, this is half, this is um, the fees are at 50% of what they had been pre pandemic. So the board had voted to cut them in half. So just keep that in mind. Um, but so our, our proposal is that brew pubs, because they are section 12s, they'd fall 
and to Ivory's point, they are licensed as restaurants, so they would just fall right into that restaurant all out or wine and malt category. Our recommendation um, for farmer series pouring permits is to add that as a new um, uh, fee or uh, license, um, but set it at the restaurant wine and malt rate. Um, yeah. So that seems to make sense to me. Other thoughts? It makes sense. Okay. Before I close out, I just want to ask Ivria if I missed anything. <laughs> no, I think you did a great job, Katie. That covered um, all of the questions we had for the select board. Great. So can I, I just want to say for the select board um, that I, I do understand Ivria is working with Katie to bring us actually sort of a uh, get me rewrite on all of our alcohol regs kind of and, and there's a number of things that will need more changes so the discussion tonight has focused just around these specific changes for microbrews but we will see all these again because there's another set of things to make our uh alcohol regs more compliant for with typical laws i guess it's a recall we have our own unique version that developed over time and we're going to try to become more standardized yep right so i i mean i think katie and i defer to the to the wisdom of the board here you know you could hold your hearing and just adopt the changes that would impact um farmer brewer series farmer series pouring permits and then at a later date kind of look ho more holistically at the regulations in total and we could present the changes then um or you could do them all together in july i think the thought process was that would be a lot um but we obviously defer to the board if you if you want to see them all we can present them all so, so I don't think it makes sense to do them all. I just wanted to let people know they're going to be seeing them more frequently than we have in a while because yep. they they need some updates. Mr. Nelson. Yeah, and um, on the other end of the spectrum, from someone that doesn't drink, I, I know in the past, you know, month or two, we've had an, um, about five DUIs or DWIs that have happened around here, and and I I hope that this has nothing to do with what's going on or where they're coming from in town or where they're coming from, but just I think being um, keeping an eye on that. And as we go forward in the months, is that something that is becoming more of a trend or was it just a, a bump? I, I'm just thinking about that and how I'm sure there's other people that are not opposed from alcohol and not opposed to microbreweries, but also just want to really keep that in mind as to what we're doing and what some people are taking advantage of and not endangering more lives, which I, I don't think this is going to do that, but I had to say it because as we know that I don't want that to be something that's on the rise. I hope it's just something that just happened in the last month or so. So just want to put that out in the atmosphere. Thanks. Madam Chair, um, just a couple things that generally, because I know we're talking about in the future doing something uh, with our regulations. And because you know it's tied to the restaurants, when you think of the 35% limitation, you know, you talk about John Harvard's, if they stop serving beer, no one's going to that restaurant. That's not why they were going there. So I think when you have that cap, and originally I was hoping you could separate this from that and say, for this, you can brew pubs, you can go to 50% or whatever. I just want to make sure we look at that kind of holistically now that we're going to introduce this, because that could be a barrier. And then secondly, um, the zones, I just had a question on the actual proposed zones from the planning board where a brew pub is allowed by special permit, is that all the zones where a restaurant is currently allowed or I, you wouldn't have to answer that tonight. I just wanna make sure that that, because to me it's a restaurant and maybe we can talk to the planning board. I'd like to see that match up. And then also I know they did consider for the microbrewery kind of expanding or there was some discussion, but I think if you look at Needham Crossing or mixed use 128, that'd be another kind of destination place for one of these, but uh, that's not our call. Uh, we can weigh in on it, but those are just the comments I had. Yeah, we're talking about it. I will definitely get back to you on the question about brew pubs relative to where restaurants are zoned. I will say that I know explicitly that there was a, a distinction made in Chestnut Street Business District okay. to have brew pubs only be in a subset of that district based on neighbor feedback. Okay. Um, so there's at least that one change, but I can get you a fuller okay. answer. That'd yeah. be great. Thank you. And I'm, I'm just thinking the question about the 35%, I don't know, Amy, if you found anything in your research, if people have a higher number, but it it generally strikes me whether you're thinking about John Harvard's or another chain of brew pubs that I would think of Iron Hill, 
um, near my parents in Pennsylvania, but I think Pennsylvania, Washington, whatever down there, fundamentally they are a restaurant. So it would make sense to me that they would be within our 35% compliance number, even though they brew beer there and they certainly sell their own beer there. But I don't know if there's anybody locally who has a different experience for that. Um, I'd have to go back and look at the, the, the research, but one of the things that we did discuss was whether or not that 35% would include um, off-premises um, sales as oh, well. Yeah. So if you had, you know, somebody come in and, and they had dinner and they ordered a few beers and if they wanted to bring home a couple of growlers or four pack, if that four pack or growler should be counted against that 35%, yeah. it, it, that, that really is the distinction is that's more of a retail sale Correct. and it's not on premise consumption. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So figuring out that accounting or how people have to prepare for that makes sense, but potentially the 35% might make sense to maintain for on-premise consumption. All right. And I don't think we're typically up at that percent for most of our restaurants. Just a note that there's not actually a prohibition on 35 percent. And it's a it's a threshold by which the board then looks at this right. and, and, and investigates to determine whether there's a problem. Right. So restaurants that have high takeout, for instance, um, you know, there was a skewing and these kinds of things. So, yeah, yeah, it, it is up to the board's discretion. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yeah, um, there was a limit on 15,000 gallons per year, right? Is that it? 15,000 gallons? For a um, microbrewery. In a microbrewery, right? In the planning board's is that the definition. Yeah, this yeah. So they grappled with um, just the overall size of the business um, okay. entity and the amount of space it would take to brew at what volume. Okay. Um, so that, that was the context by which they came to had that discussion. Okay. I, I was wondering if that was a uh, state regulation as well. I don't know. I don't know, Afria, if you know. It's not. No, it's the ABCC has different licensing fees based on how many barrels per year, what the production level is, but there isn't like a, a cap um, that would mirror with what's been proposed here. This, from my understanding, comes from a zoning um, perspective. Right. Is it barrels? Not gallons. I said gallons, but it's barrels. Barrels. Right. barrels. I think it's barrels. Okay. My and my only two cents about that is they say it's 10 gallons for of water to process and make one gallon of beer. Mm -hmm. So I would just want planning board to be mindful that there should be either water, wastewater treatment before it goes back in and just what the town's water load would be. But that's that's a real consideration brewing beer. But it wouldn't affect us yep. with the plan, the board. Great. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thanks you. for all this work. I am It's a lot. <laughs> to research. Thanks Thank again. Thank you. Thank you. That was a lot of work. That is that is a lot of work. That is a lot of work. Doesn't Katie have a genius for charts? Yes, yeah. I, I am a visual. I, so helpful. Thank you. I do it for myself. Yes. And then I <laughs> All right. So our next matter of business is remote participation. Um, with public bodies. And so we had an initial uh, policy to review. We've had some feedback from many people um, and we're now taking a look again. Yes, um, I'd say uh, before we dive into the recommended changes, um, there was additional state action since your last meeting. Um, so the state Senate voted in their FY23 budget to extend the COVID flexibilities till December 15th of 2023 so that those flexibilities would allow remote only to continue. Um, the House did not include any language, and so that'll have to get reconciled through the rest of the state budget process. Um, the last few years, the state budget's been finalized not until like mid-July, so I think we're pretty much on track to know like right around when the expiration date is. Um, so all the more reason that this is prudent, so at least there's stability um, while the state lands where they land. Um, so yes, so that happened. And um, to the chair's point, um, we got good feedback from boarding committee members that's been shared with you all in advance. Um, so I will just quickly run through um, and first of all, thank all the people that did a good review and sent us their thoughtful comments. Um, so the changes that were made to the draft policy based on that feedback, um, I can just run through quickly. 
in section 2.3, we just made it more clear that the Commission on Disabilities is exempt from this policy because under the state regulations, they can um, decide this for themselves. Um, down in section four, um, clarify that a family illness or disability is a, an acceptable extenuating circumstance. Um, the top of page three, again, in section four, I got really good feedback that it is likely that somebody could need to be remote for multiple meetings in a row if it's an illness, if it's a geographic challenge. And so the way it read originally, it was more uh, conducive to intermittent remote um, as opposed to maybe if somebody needed a couple of meetings in a row. And so we changed uh, the language to have it be over a calendar year. Um, I'm going to put a pin in this paragraph and come back to it at the very end. Um, made one additional change in the last paragraph of section four, just to be more clear that the chair is allowing or declining the member's request for remote participation. Section 6.3, again, really thoughtful feedback that people did not want the chair to share publicly the reason they were remote. Um, as long as they just share that it's been approved, then that suffices to say that it's uh, in compliance with this policy. So coming back to the top of page three in section four, I just wanna highlight, we had received um, a comment after I had put this packet together and it really was around this question of 25% of the meetings that someone could be remote. Um, I will say we have the, the phrase, except in extraordinary circumstances, that really would be at the discretion of the chair. The feedback we received was to please change that to 33%. So really a board member could be remote a third of the meetings as opposed to what we have, which is a quarter of the meetings. Um, so I think the only question for the board is um, either to approve this as proposed or approve this with that amendment to go to 33%. Happy to answer any questions. It's at the discretion of the chair. Is as drafted, yeah. Okay. Oh, what what an, ex, an extraordinary circumstance is would be at the discretion of each board's chair. Do you think we need to clarify that to say an extraordinary circumstances at the discretion of the board's chair? Do you think there will be a question about what constitutes that or who makes that decision if we don't say that? Um, I think we got the question overall of who ultimately is the decision maker here and so i think for the entire policy the decision maker is the chair of that of that individual board um i don't know that it needs to be explicit just for that paragraph okay. right because it's six point three, it says it's kind of maybe not the same as that one but saying that they're not going to be there remotely yeah as approved by the chair so it's there what i'm saying is it's kind of still approved by the chair. It says it there, but not there. Yeah, the last paragraph of section four, the chair, the person designated uh, to chair the meeting may allow or decline oh, remote yes. participation yep. and that decision shall be final. It really is the statement for the whole policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thoughts on the 25%? I guess. I still think a 25% is a reasonable number, uh, understanding that there is discretion if there's a good reason to do something different, but. Madam Chair, I would agree with that. I think it gives discretion to get, and I'm look, trying to do the math. If you had 10 meetings, it'd probably be, or 20 would be, you know, one more potentially. And I think that would, that discretion is fine um, to give that extra meeting if they deem it necessary. So I'd, I'd rather stay low and then go up then go up right away. I do, um, there are, I have heard from at least one committee that somebody on the committee has indicated that if they were required to come back in person, they wouldn't just because it didn't fit in their schedule. Hmm. You know, to some extent, I sort of feel like we need to put a policy in place and see what happens and see what settles out in terms of time. Um, because I, I do believe that people will have better discussions in person than across Zoom all the time. But now, Yeah, I think I believe that as well. Um, under the circumstances, if this is to get extended, then this would we would fall back from this language, right? Correct. If that, to the state language, yeah, to the which state, is more if, permissive. Okay. So just wanted to just clarify and just make sure that that would be an option. Um, I think for the committees, you know, if we were to go to the 33%, 
it's really that the chair and in that member kind of having real conversations about is this beneficial to our committee is this something that you need and i think if we were to give more we're still leaving it up with the confidence of the chair whoever that committee to help determine that i, I don't think that would be a negative per se but i understand what you're saying as being in person um kind of changes um how the meeting is run but i think if we're leaving it up to the chair regardless to add make it 33 percent and give them a, a particular person a little bit more wiggle room if deemed necessary we're allowing our chair to help make that that, that specific chair right and and back to your point marcus the reason for doing this now is if we do not put a policy in place we do not have a policy for remote right. participation. It could all go away as of July 15th. Right. That was just saying between if the 225 percent and the 33 yeah. percent. So yeah. To okay. Do something. Yeah. I don't have a strong feeling between 25 and 30. I mean, I, I don't think it makes too much of a difference so long as you know the chair is um, using their relationship with the member to make an appropriate decision <coughs> for the benefit of the committee. So. Any other thoughts? Um, yeah. I actually had to do a meeting remote yesterday because of distance. And the experience was really left a lot to be desired. It's just not as good. Um, it's so stilted. And it's great to be able to see it and participate. I mean, to understand it, but the, the participation really isn't quite there. Um, if people are just doing remote for convenience, then I, I don't necessarily have that much sympathy. I mean, I, I appreciate their effort, but, you know, uh, we gotta be in. So I guess I'm, I'm thinking the 25% might be appropriate, especially it's over a calendar year. And it could be at the, you know, the chair's discretion. My only clarifying question is, I was at a meeting and someone said that the chairs cannot be remote. Is this true? I didn't read it in here, but, it's yeah. true. Um, the chair could delegate to somebody else to chair that meeting. Yeah. If they, if the, you know, if Marian needed to be remote, All right. you know, she. Delegated. But she could be remote, but not chair. Correct. Okay. So you have to be in person to chair the meeting. Okay. Um, and if you're remote, you can vote. Just to clarify. That. I do not think right. that articulated here, is it? Um, three point two. Is it? Oops. 3.2. Thank you. Yeah, 3.2. Thank you for the body, including the chair or person authorized to chair the meeting. You've been in the chair's absence, but the chair is remote. It seems silent to me. Um, sorry, it's hard to read through this on the fly, but I will say um, it's a requirement on the state regulation. So even if our policy is silent on it, um, it's still a requirement. So it would be great if it was explicit just for clarity, um, but the policy stands regardless because okay. it's in the state regulation. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah. So uh, we could say in the chair's absence or what we're saying is the chair's not physically present, right? Or if the chair is remote, it feels like it's a reasonable clarification. Well, 3.4 says that if they're remote, they're not deemed absent. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But, but it does right. make sense to me that the person chairing that particular meeting should be in the room yeah, for the meeting. So, yeah. so you might get a we'll quorum, but the vice chair would do it. I mean, if the board is so it's or uh, um, if the chair is remote, we could wordsmith yeah, that. We can, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. We know what you're trying to say. If that yeah. piece yeah. Of wanted to yes. adopt it, and you're just okay. trying to show that if the chair's uh, the chair has to be physically present or have someone physically present running. Right. right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Any other clarifying questions, or or um, we can give a motion that offers the ability for some friendly amendment there. Madam Chair, we'd like a motion. Oh. Go ahead. So. Love a motion. Then I'll come back to you. <laughs> okay. okay. Yep. <laughs> I move the select board vote to adopt the member remote participation in public meetings policy um, with the addition that the chair has to be um, physically present at the meeting and to authorize the town manager to implement remote participation consistent with said policy pursuant to 940 CMR 29.10, parenthesis 2, parenthesis A, and further to encourage all town boards 
commissions and committees to continue to provide a means for the general public to view public meetings remotely. Is there a second? Second. second. Mr. Nelson. Yes, thank you so much. Um, the accept extraordinary circumstances. What if the, the member feels like it's extraordinary and the chair doesn't? It is at the chair's discretion. So bottom line, that is, okay. Just wanted to clarify that <laughs> as what that is. We didn't have Brave new territory. Yeah, we didn't have anything spelled out. So I just wanted to know what if that ever comes up and there's some kind of conflict. I presume we might hear about it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. New territory for us too. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, then coming into the vote, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? It's a unanimous vote. So we will have remote participation continue after July 15th, Thank no you. matter what happens. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. All right. Anything else, town manager? No. Ooh. No. Wow. Oh, well, you, you have a board discussion. That's a first. All right. So um, the next item on our agenda is a board discussion. People have been sent a draft of a letter um, that is proposed to send to the planning board on the select board's behalf from the town manager as it relates to 557 Highland Avenue, um, the Highland Innovation Center, also known as Muzzy, <laughs> the Muzzy property. Um, so this uh, letter was generated after um, some discussion that uh, Marcus and I had with the town manager and uh, the developer in terms of providing some feedback um, to the planning board about how we're thinking about these things. I guess I will say that the developer has been um, listening very, very carefully to the Needham community um, with what uh, people's wishes and hopes are for a variety of amenities on that site and for uh, what people would like to see happen, how they're hoping it will look from the street you know, different things like that. So, so short of uh, things like we want it to go away or we want it all to turn into a park or we want it just to be 500% smaller, right? Presuming there is a development there, there that will be a gateway. Um, I believe that Bullfinch truly believes that they are trying to make a gateway project for Needham that, um, that Needham will be proud of and that will signal an entrance to the town. So uh, we had some comments as they related to sustainability, traffic, traffic, transportation, demand management. Sorry, my page is stuck here parking and then um, our race equity vision for the town. Uh, I will note that the um, developer has committed to a number of these. Uh, in fact, all, all of them already. So we are really just reinforcing what in fact our particular values that we think the select board and the town have in these major uh, areas. So any other thoughts as people had read this? Madam Chair, yes, um, thank you for that introduction. You know, when I saw this original list, I think, you know, we have to be careful as a board on the suggestions that we make, especially because they can, they will probably turn into conditions. Um, so certain things such as energy policy, et cetera. Um, I just wanted more clarification on that as we move forward. But uh, the idea that they've already, they've agreed to this and that they're amenable to it and, and deciding to do it on their own, I think, um, takes us out of the equation that way. And if they're committed to doing these things, um, I think the lead certification is terrific. Um, I know there's a question on traffic that uh, we yeah. can discuss um, and make sure that's right size for the project. Cause I know that's a concern that it almost could be uh, too efficient and therefore be a cut through for some people. So as long as, you know, those things are taken care of. And I know last um, meeting we talked about, and that's in the, uh, the letter too about that last mile and, and uh, transportation. Um, I think it's covered in this. So um, with that, I'd support this letter. All right. I don't think we need a vote on that for Kate. We just need to authorize you to send the letter, to send the letter on our behalf, right? It was, a, I did ask you for a mm -hmm. vote. You but did ask for a but vote. But that's the vote to authorize. Yeah. <laughs> the vote is to authorize, okay. 
I'm not looking at that one. But <laughs> then do I have a motion? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, a motion that the board authorize the town manager to forward a letter to the planning board relative to Highland Innovation Center project. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Unanimous vote. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've now put on a, a section at the end for committee reports because, in fact, the board has been quite active in committees, and um, we've tended to be off <laughs> doing our committee work, and it comes back at sporadic intervals, but it seems like we ought to make a more conscious effort to keep everyone apprised of the various committees and what is going on on them uh, at the current time. So I'm going to ask if anybody wants to lead off. Otherwise, I will be happy to. Heidi, I'm happy to lead off. So I am um, sitting on the housing plan working group and I'm part of the uh, zoning subgroup. Um, the committee has done a great deal of work establishing guideline or guiding principles, um, a lot of foundation work as in um, assessing the situation as it stands currently. And then um, on Thursday night, the um, subgroups, which um, are capacity, uh, production and zoning, the three subgroups um, made their uh, subcommittee reports to the main group, which um, included sort of a um, assessment of where we stand. And in some cases, some recommendations moving forward, um, all of which will be sort of reconciled and brought forward in the report when the uh, committee is done with its work. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. I Anybody else? Not I. Um, so I could report, uh, we, yeah, were, to do it. <laughs> we were, at, Kevin and I were at the climate action planning committee last night, yeah. last night, um, that committee, uh, took some time yesterday with the town manager and, uh, Cindy Roy Gonzalez joined us to talk about community electricity aggregation. All right, which is something that this board will be discussing as part of their goals. The CAPC has actually asked um, the board to uh, consider that. That's the number one priority that they have for the town for the next year, um, because it is probably the single largest thing that can be done by the town relating to every household in town. Uh, so in terms of moving our energy to more green energy and making sure that that is offered to everyone. Um, so we did hear sort of a discussion about what's going on in other municipalities, what a process might look like. The process will involve a town meeting vote uh, to just authorize us to begin <coughs> what is essentially a year and a half long process to engage in that and to roll out um, a product to the town. So that was the first discussion. And then we had a discussion really about process. Uh, of developing a plan and how that might work and how we would uh, kind of organize to think about that. Um, the other need that was relayed to the town manager, um, the town is currently working with MAPC to do a greenhouse gas inventory of municipal uh, uses of greenhouse gases. Um, we actually need to have a greenhouse ga gas inventory of the entire town. One was done by Green Needham something less than a year ago, using the resources that they had. Um, we believe that if MAPC were to do it, that they have access to some better resources, maybe in pulling that whole thing together. And um, that will in fact be an important foundational piece for that committee, for their work in terms of prioritizing what they would tackle <coughs> first, second, and third to make an imp impact on the town's uh, footprint right. for, for reduction of greenhouse gases. Um, and then the second thing that I went to last night was um, to the cops and community, which um, maybe I'll turn to Marcus and he might want to talk about that one. Absolutely. Um, so I would say last night, um, we may not have had all the numbers that we wanted to from a community standpoint. It's something we will definitely continue to work to progress on. But I feel like for the people that were there and some that were on Zoom, it was um an overwhelming success i would say all the work that katie kate um and all the rest of the planning committee kind of put in to do that was it was a great kind of cap off to our third and final of the series events we're having uh, quentin williams come in and talk about his experience and just building relationships and talking about basically we had four different groups we had about 
15 police officers, including the police chief, um, spread out between the different groups and talked about, you know, what's the thing that keeps you up at night? And there were so many real moments in there to talk about perspective, to talk about relationship building, to talk about education, um, to talk about, you know, what it means to be a police officer, but what it means when you don't have the uniform on and when you put it on and when you take it off who you are. And there were some great recommendations, everything from inviting law enforcement to block parties, you know, with their families, having that, I think, getting to know someone is to share bread with them or to break bread with someone is like, that's when you really get an opportunity to know who you are and what you stand for and get to know someone's family. So I would say that it was very insightful. I feel like the, the community was heard and I feel like law enforcement was heard. And more than anything, what we wanna do is to help break the historical, um, precedent that was set by policing from its um, foundation, you know, with slave patrol to where it is now. And, and education is going to do that. And the commitment to building relationships and listening to understand is going to help do that. And I, there were five pillars. I don't remember them all, but one of them was rooted in pain. And I feel like the pain, acknowledgement, all those things are so important when it comes to um, how to move forward as a town, how to move forward with the views of public safety and also with public safety to think about how they're interacting with its constituents. And I love the term, getting rid of the term policing a community to um, uh, with serving, serving. Oh, yeah, to serving, to serving our community. So that was really stuck with me is when you say, what do you do? Like I, I'm, I'm part of, I'm a public servant for our community and, you know, focusing and intentionally being, um, getting out of the cars and biking more and walking more within communities and having conversations with people just to see how they're doing, just to ask questions and in eye contact. And it's, it was a lot last night and I was very thankful for it. And I just love um, to see where we take this from here and how we expand on this. So I would definitely encourage people to watch the session. Yes, absolutely. Um, but it was great to be there in conversation. And I am grateful to the chief uh, for his oh, yes. work with his department and for bringing so many guys last night to have those conversations as well. Because I think there were people in the room who have often um, been more critical of policing. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, but I think it was a healthy conversation for everyone to have together very vulnerable and to transparency was really good. And I know Kevin and I saw Matt on Zoom. So I know it was probably a different feeling than not being in the room, kind of like what Kevin hinted on, but being in the room and listening and watching reactions and the it's amount really of snaps powerful. and the amount of just, it was, it was a very amazing feeling and just listening to Quentin's story. It is fascinating. So thank you all that helped bring that to life. So that was that. Um, I represented the board at the farmer's market, which in case you didn't know, opened for the 11th season on Greensfield. Um, I hope you all will get a chance to shop yeah. there sometime this summer. Um, and I want to say thank you to Matt, who I know attended the historic commission yes. for, for another one that's likely to be coming our way to go to town meeting uh, at some point in the future to keep us up to speed on that. Yep. So great. Thank you. Anything else that people want to talk about that they've been out at recently. If not, then I would welcome a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>